الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ علیہ علیہ وصاحب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ادو اللہ صبیل رب کا بلکما و المعزت الحسنہ وجاد بلت احسن رب شل صدری و سلی عمری وحل العدت من لسانی حفق و قولی اول کم آل دی ویورز آف دا پیش ٹی وی نیٹ ورک دا پیش ٹی وی انگلش دا پیش ٹی وی اردو دا پیش ٹی وی بنگلہ ایز ویل ایز دا پیش ٹی وی چائنیز اینڈ آل آن مائی سوشل میڈیا پلیٹ فارم آل دی ویورز آن مائی سوشل میڈیا پلیٹ فارم وچ آر دا فیس بک دا یوٹیوب دا انسٹاگرام دا ٹویٹر اینڈ دا ہلی دا پلیٹ فارم آئی ویلکم آل دی ویورز ود اسلامک گریٹنگز السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ میں پیس مرسی اینڈ بلیسنگس آف اللہ سبحانہ و تعالیٰ اور فرم آف آل مائی ٹی گاڈ بی آن آل آف یو آئی ویلکم یو ٹو دس پروگرام آسک ڈاکٹر ذاکر سیزن الیون سیشن فائیو I welcome you all, I welcome all the viewers to this program, Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 11, Session 5. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compassion religion, or any question which a non-Muslim may have asked and you are unable to reply, or anything you find on the media regarding Islam, this is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of the social media, but as you know, the best would be to send your question as a text message on the WhatsApp mentioning your name, your profession, and your city and country of origin, along with the question in brief to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat, plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. And you might have noticed that the first time I'm appearing in front of the camera without spectacles. Just to inform you that Alhamdulillah, 11 days ag ago, I had an eye surgery on my right eye. That's last Thursday. And eight days before, that is last Friday, I had eye surgery on the left eye. These surgeries on both my eyes were regarding cataract. And along with cataract, it was also a lens implantation, a triocular lens. So just to inform you that, you know that this new technology of LASIX came several years back, but it's not advisable for elderly people to do LASIX because the number may change and then cataract may develop. So most of my children, Farik and Zikra, they did their surgery in 2016. And my daughter just did a few months before in Malaysia. When I went for my eye checkup, they realized that I had early stages of cataract. There was no problem in my vision, but early stages of cataract, you know that cataract normally appears after the age, normally generally starts after the age of 45, maybe about 30, 40% have after the age of 45. By the age of 65, more than 50% have it. By the age of 75, about 60 to 70%, or 75% of them have cataract. It's not that every adult should have cataract, but chances are high. So when the early stages developed, there was no problem. But that means I may have to do surgery after five years, or after 10 years. So I took the opportunity that why don't I do a dual surgery to remove the cataract, though it's on the early stage, wasn't causing me any problem. And now the technology has improved, the operation hardly lasts for 10 minutes. And we remove the cataract. And they implanted a lens, because as you know that I'm hypometric and a myopic, that means I am far-sighted and short-sighted, both put together. That means I require glasses for seeing clearly the vision which is in the distance, as well as near vision. So I used to wear a progressive specs. My specs had a lens which was progressive. That came about maybe 15, 20 years back. Previously, it was only far-sighted. And I'm wearing specs since approximately the age of eight or nine, maybe I was in the third, fourth, I don't remember exactly. So I'm wearing specs surely for more than 45 years, maybe for 50 years, Allah Alam. Approximately 45 to 50 years. So it's the first time in my life, Alhamdulillah, my operation was more than a week back. And now, Alhamdulillah, after one week, you can see mostly very well. But the complete rest of the eye should be for at least one month to three months. So this is the first time, mashallah, I'm appearing 
in any program or a live session in front of a camera or any talk I'm giving without my specs. So it's a new look of mine. So inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may my vision remain normal for the rest of my life and may I be able to see the far, the close and the medium also because I put a triocular lens. That means I can see far vision also, near vision also, as well as intermediary. And Alhamdulillah, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may I didn't do the operation because I wanted to look better without specs. I don't know. I think maybe I may, people are used to looking at me with specs, so it's a brand with my cap and the specs. But of course, being specs free is, it removes many of hassles, you know. When we go for any sports or when we go to the washroom, you go to have a bath, you have to remove it, you go for swimming, or if you go into the beach, there are various ways that you have to really take care of your specs. So Alhamdulillah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that May my eyes be normal and I pray that inshallah may it be till the end of my life the vision may be good and uh, may I not have to do any other surgery on my. So inshallah we take the first question from the WhatsApp. <coughs> I'm sorry she have a habit of <laughs> putting my specs. So this is going to take some days or weeks till it gets uh, removed, the habit of, you know, sometimes I wonder where my specs are. <coughs> the first question, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam wa Muhammad Aslam from Karachi, Pakistan. I am a student. I came across a post with your photograph containing the below information. I wanted to confirm how authentic is this information? And he has sent the post. And the post has my photograph, a very sharp, maybe taken out from one of my websites, a very clear image of mine. And at the side of the photograph, it is mentioned, we should not write it as inshallah, in what it comes, I N S H A capital A L L H, or Inshallah, I N S H A L L E H together in word commerce because it means create Allah, knows Billah. Whether Arabic or English, please make sure we write it properly as in word commerce in space, I in space, Sha S H A A space with S capital, then A capital L L A H close in word commerce. That means in three separate words. In, then Shah and Allah and space between these three words. In brackets, in three separate words. This means, if Allah wills, to make sure you forward this to everyone and help them to correct their mistake too. Jazakallah khair, inshallah. Dr. Zakir Naik fan club of Facebook, www.facebook.com slash Zakir Naik official. Before I reply to this question whether the information in this post is authentic or not, let me tell you that this post was not uploaded by me. These words do not belong to me. As we discussed in the last session, that is, as Dr. Zakir sees in 11, session 4, that every post that you find in the social media with my photograph, etc., doesn't have to mean it belongs to me. And I told, you have to see at the bottom, go to my Facebook whether it's available there or not, or you can go to my website. And here it is clearly mentioned at the bottom, it says that Dr. Zakir Naik fan club on Facebook. Dr. Zakir Naik fan club on Facebook doesn't mean it is officially mine. Though the Facebook address says Zakir Naik official. But Above it, it says it's a fan club of Dr. Zakir Naik, meaning it is posted by my fans that does not belong to me. And this post has been circulating in the social media for several years. And maybe tens of millions of people have read it. I myself, in the last several years, have received that Dr. Zakir, is it correct? And it was difficult for me to reply because this message is not totally correct. 
and he, it is partly correct regarding what is mentioned in this post i'll come to it first let me tell you that this post was not uploaded by me it is not my words it does not belong to my official facebook page it's a fan page and as i told you many people out of enthusiasm they put my photographs so that they get more viewers this is haram but maybe the niya is good and as i discussed in the last session if the niya is good may allah forgive them but fabricating something what i have not said it is wrong it is haram so i did not say this regarding the information mentioned in this that do not write inshallah as one word i n s h a a l l e h or with inshallah with a capital a is wrong it means create allah rather write in space sha space allah i n space s h a a space a l l a h inshallah please circulate this you will get thawab jazakallah khair i received this several years before this message somebody forwarded to me and i showed this post to umpteen number of arabs arabs from saudi arabia from qatar from uae from yemen various those who are scholars who are phd's in islam they are dai's and i received mixed response when i received this question on the facebook i asked my son farik what was this why don't you check on the net even he went on the and he googled and there were many arabic replies given by arabs i'm not talking about non arab non arabs i'll come to it later on and some of the videos said that saying this is wrong what is mentioned here it means creator allah should not say and some of them said it is okay some of them say you are spitting yes there were different replies what i believe now after hearing from the various different arabs some phd some scholars some duats that we know for sure that in arabic inshallah is spelled in arabic alif noon and there's a space in then there's a space then sha sheen alif then there's a space and then allah alif lam ha so surely in arabic in sha allah are three separate words this is without doubt so in arabic it is three separate words in sha allah which means if allah wills without doubt and several places in the quran these words inshallah are there in space sha space allah inshallah in arabic there is no doubt it's there it's mentioned in the quran in surah baqara chapter number 2 verse number 70 it's mentioned in surah yusuf chapter number 12 verse number 99 it's mentioned in surah kahf chapter number 18 verse number 59 verse number 69 it's mentioned in surah qasas chapter number 28 verse number 27 in surah as-saffat chapter number 37 verse number 102 in surah az-zumr chapter number 39 verse number 38 and it's also mentioned in surah fatah chapter number 48 verse number 27 there are several places this word insha allah are mentioned as three separate words with a space meaning if allah wills and there are various other forms uh, that are there but these are exactly insha allah that then the quran I mentioned it is several places where it's mentioned. There are many more places. So in Arabic, without doubt, it is mentioned in three separate words with a space in between. There is no doubt. Now, when we write in English, in the transliteration, there are various forms in different ways that it is written by Muslims. And in the post, it says that some people write as "Inshallah" as one word, "I N S H A A L L H" as one word. or inshallah with i capital n s h a a and a capital l l h as one word or some people write as two words insha i n s h a a then space a l l h but the post says the right and the correct authentic way is to write in i n space i capital in space sha 
S capital H A A space Allah A L L A H A capital. This is the authentic way. So what is my comment? Is this correct or is it wrong? I would say the post is to a great extent correct, but if you ask me which is the best way to write in English transliteration, then the post is correct. The second part is correct. That is the correct way to write in English transliteration is I N space S H A space A L L A H or in Sha in Sha Allah I N S H A A double A then space then A capital L L A A H because in transliteration I am a bit particular because you know in the books and I am a person who is supposed to be trying they call me a perfectionist so in the correct transliteration Allah should be translated should be translated in English as A L L A on top of A there is a dash which many people don't know what it means but in the original English language these are marks which means you have to elongate it so if there is a dash above A that means A should be elongated so whenever in Arabic there is an alif or if there is a khara alif or a mad that letter is elongated if it's a zabar or it is a fata then it's a single a but if it is a mad with a short mad or a long mad or if it's an alif the right string should be a with a dash on top but people aren't aware of this so in modern english many people what they do instead of the dash they write double a and that's what i've started doing since the last about four years or five years in most of our posts we started spelling Allah instead of A L L H as A L L double A H Islam instead of I S L A M I S L A M and this is more authentic the right is with the dash but people don't know this type of English in the modern English so there are some Muslims and even myself who prefer writing Islam with I S L A A L A A M because Islam has an alif Alif, Seen, Lam, Alif. So if there is an Alif, as I mentioned, or a Mad, or a Khara Alif, it's a double A. Or if it's on, if it's a single Kasra, then it's a E, and if it's, if it has a Mad, then elongate it, becomes double E. So these are the correct way of transliteration. So the way I write, Inshallah, is I capital N with a space and Sha. There is an alif, so S H A A, then space, and then Allah A L L A A H. The way I write. Lately, a couple of years back, I realized that my team in the social media said that this is the new style of spelling. So everyone may not so in Google search you won't get it, or in the YouTube search you may not get it. So it's better in the title we write the the spelling which is more common for Islam I F L A M. The more common spelling for Allah is A L L H. So now you find in my sports, you find in my sports, uh, in my posts, and in my YouTube videos, sometimes double A, sometimes single A. You know, my social media people saying we are more. Our main aim is people should find it in searching. So if you write I S L A M for Islam, or Quran Q U R A A A double A N Q U R apostrophe double a and very few people will find it in the search so because of that we went back to the more common spelling rather than the more authentic spelling but in short if you ask me the best way to transliterate transliterate and write in english is i and space i capital n space sha f capital h a a space allah a capital l l a h this is the right way. Now, if someone merges and writes it, is it correct? If someone writes insha and then Allah, is it correct? Or someone writes inshallah as one word, is it correct? And the post says it means create Allah. So when I ask this question, does inshallah if you write together, or if you pronounce it together, or if you say insha Allah, does it mean create Allah? So some of the opinion, yes, it means. Some of the opinion, no, it has no meaning at all. Some say that it is best to avoid. 
but all of them agreed that the best way i asked those people who know english and arabic i didn't ask only an arab because arab knows very well that inshallah should be separate i asked those people who were fluent in english and arab and they were arabs arabic is the mother tongue and they're fluent in english many of the dua that come on peace tv all of them agreed that the best and authentic way is to write in separate space then shah separate space allah this is the most and in transliteration normally when you transliterate it has to be whatever the original language from which you're transliterating you have to see that if there's a space there should be a space even in the transliteration i know many people don't do it the right way and they merge it and they say no problem so if you ask me which is the best way the best way is as it is mentioned in the post in then space shah then space then allah whether you want to write double a for shah or double a for allah that's your choice both are correct but the more authentic according to me is double a for shah and double a for allah but is it wrong if someone writes inshallah together as one word or insha one word and allah the other is it right and i've discussed this with people who are even in the islamic field you know because my post became so popular so we had many fatwas in 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 pakistan and in india given by various madrasas by deoband by many madrasas in pakistan and now today because of this post it is so viral that tens of millions of people have read it and started asking this fatwa so even you have fatwas in the urdu scholars or urdu shiuks giving and most of them agree that writing inshallah separately is is the right way if you write together some post say it is wrong some say it is not wrong it is an ignorance so it's okay and some went to say the right way is to write it separately as three words but if you join join it and write it is not a big issue there is no problem you don't have to make a mountain out of a mole so as i told you what was the reply i got with the arabs the same reply is there with the ulama or the shiuks from pakistan or from india that the best is to write separately but if you write some some of the websites say that it is wrong you should not do it and some said it's okay if you do it there's not a big issue and you can continue doing it so i am of the opinion that the opinion is that best is to write it separately if you write together out of ignorance inshallah there's no issue but since you know now that writing writing separately is better you should write separately you know some people say no because what i was doing earlier i stick to it this is stubbornness but naturally if someone writes out of ignorance together there is no issue at all i don't think so allah will hold responsible inshallah allah will forgive you if you write together as one word or as two words inshallah allah will forgive you there are some arabs who say that if you write inshahu allahi mudaf mudaf ale it means great allah and it is wrong so because it doesn't have the fatha dhamma etc when you write normal arabic so some say avoid it some say no problem but i'm of the view that if you really want to be accurate it's better you write in sha allah separately i n s h a separately with the space and a l l h but if someone writes together and means that if allah wills i feel inshallah there is no problem allah will not hold you responsible i don't want to say that the post it's no billah create allah is there but when the difference of opinion better be safe rather than sorry and the usul of fiqh that when you can know for sure when everyone says what is right and the second opinion people disagree better follow the first when everyone agrees that's right so that is the reason i prefer writing inshallah as three separate words and we know that in transliteration some people say no problem while you are transliterating when you are transliterating and if you remove the space no problem i disagree with this there is a problem imagine if you write together if allah wills imagine if you write complete if you want to transliterate or translate bismillah rahman rahim as in the name of allah most gracious most merciful without spaces even i know english well will not be able to read it 
because I know by heart in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful I may be able to decipher it but if someone who doesn't know the meaning and if I have to read together imagine there are 200 letters together in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful how will I know where the word is ending so it's wrong to say that whether you have space or don't have space it means the same no if you are a professional person to translate or transliterate if there's a space in the original language you have to keep the space even in the transliteration if you remove it out of ignorance in inshallah Allah will forgive you there's no problem in it but to be stubborn and saying in transliteration you can do it the way you want it is totally wrong I remember in 2016 when we had the international dawa training program we had about six students from Malaysia and one student his name was I'll tell you later I read it I said what is this Siafik Apandi Siafik I'm hearing this first time a Muslim name Siafik S Y A F I Q Siafik Apandi so he got up there no Zakir bhai, Dr. Zakir Naik, it is Shafiq. I said Shafiq? Shafiq should be S-H-A-F-I-Q. He said no, no, in Malaysian language we spell S-H as S-Y. I said oh, thank you for the information. In 2016, I've been to Malaysia several times, I did not know at that time that for sure you spell it as S-Y in Malay. And since this is a proper noun, so no problem it's a Malaysian name and you spell SHSY the proper name is a proper name you can spell it the way your language says there's no problem later on since the Dawa training program was in English he writes Isha as I S Y A A I said what is this I S Y A A it is Isha Zakir Bhai how can you write Isha as I S Y A A I said this is how we spell in Malaysia I said fine at your home you can do it but this Dawa training program is in English and you know English very well you cannot say that I will transliterate from Arabic Isha into English as I S Y A A it is wrong this is English Dawa in Malaysia I do it okay it's accepted because in Malay language S Y means sure but this is an English Dawa training program so you cannot use your Malay in English if I start using Urdu in this English training program Half of the thing you understand. So then he understood. So you cannot transliterate Isha as I S Y A and say because it's in my culture, it's right. Yes, in Malay it's accepted. But in English language, you cannot say you transliterate the way you want. It's totally wrong. In English, you have to follow the rules of English. So Isha is I S H A or I S H A A, no problem. You cannot transliterate as I S Y A, Isha. You're transliterating Arabic into English so sure means SH you cannot use SY for sure you do that in Malaysia in Malay language accept it 100% correct but you cannot use Malay rules to translate rate into English and say it is also correct no it is wrong in English language you cannot translate rate and use the Malay rules for English language so you have to be careful that you cannot be so broad and say that okay remove the space it's no problem you cannot remove space from 100 words it will have no meaning at all so in transliteration you have to follow the rules so if you follow the rules the best way to transliterate inshallah into English is I N space S H A or S H A A space A L L A A H out of ignorance if someone writes together inshallah they'll forgive it's not a major issue you don't have to make a mountain out of a mole but if you know it and if you translate it in the right way that's better no one will object and you won't waste time arguing with people whether right or wrong or wasting your time and you're following the rules of transliteration that if there is a space in the original language you have to have a space in the English transliteration this is the rules which you should follow so this answers in short and this puts an end to the discussion where what is right what is wrong because we should not waste our precious time in these small issues hope that answers the question
the second question i am santosh from mumbai i am a hindu and a businessman i have watched many of your videos on the youtube since many years recently there are short videos released on youtube replying to your talks by acharya prashant i am quoting three most popular of his answers which prove that your speeches are wrong can you please reply to them and the question is long so we will reply each of the short video separately first short video is on the topic murti puja murti puja in in hindi means idol worship so the first topic is, is on idol worship when you quoted the vedas and upanishads the saying of that god there is no image no idol no sculpture no picture no photo which means idol worship is not prescribed in hinduism acharya prashant replies that if you have love then you will also start making idols and photos that means if you love god then you start making idols and photos of god murtis idols are the door to god murti is dwar to murta if photos are childish and wrong then why do you keep your children's photo close to your heart so the argument you know this was a clipping and i went on the youtube and saw because the link was given i am hearing and seeing this person acharya prashant for the first time in my life i just saw it today when i got this question when i was selecting the questions and it's a short video showing my urdu video where i say that you know in the hindu scripture there are no differences and i said that it's mentioned in the hindu scriptures that nata se pratima the of that image there is no god and pratima means an image and i quoted the reference it was not there in the in the clip and many times they take part of my lecture and give reply to that so in that clip which was shown in his short reel only it was mentioned that nata se pratima sti of that god there is no image there is no idol there is no statue there is no sculpture there is no photo there is no painting meaning that in hinduism idol worship is not prescribed and then you have the video recording of acharya prashant i'm seeing him for the first time and he says that he says in hindi the reply is hindi i'm just translating it into english that only if you love god will you start making his idols and photos and photo is the door to worshiping god and he gives the example that don't you keep the photographs of your children close to your chest aap seene se lagate hain don't you keep the photographs of your children close to your chest so what's wrong in making photos of god now in my lecture if you see the complete version you know see my talk on similarity between islam and hinduism or my talk on concept of god major religion i am quoting that if you want to follow religion don't look at the followers look at the scriptures what they say and i quote the hindu scriptures and i say it's mentioned in the shweta sitar upanishad chapter number 4 verse number 19 na tasya pratima asti of that god there is no pratima of that god there is no image there is no statue there is no idol there is no sculpture there is no photo there is no painting and this message is repeated even in ajurved chapter number 3 to verse number 3 where it says na tasya pratima asti in sanskrit it means of that god there is no pratima pratima in sanskrit means an image an idol a statue a sculpture a painting a photograph so it's mentioned in upanishads and the vedas which are the most authentic book the number one most authentic book in the hindu religion it is the veda and number two are the upanishads they are called as shrutis the word of god so it's mentioned in yajurveda chapter number 3 to verse number 3 as well as shweta shweta upanishad chapter number 4 verse 19 na tasya pratima asti of that god there is no pratima there is no image there of that god there is no idol there is no statue there is no painting there is no sculpture there is no photograph to this he hasn't replied he just says that if you love god if you love someone you start making photos and idols 
and this is the door to worshipping God. Actually, it is the door to worshipping false God. And I had given the talk recently in Perlis, the origin of polytheism. And in that I said, the origin started by the Satan inspiring, and mentioned the Hadith, inspiring people to make statue of the honorable, good and righteous people. So when the Satan inspired people, why don't you make a statue of such a good person, you know, now he, after he had died, how will remember him? So the Satan inspired the people after the righteous people died, that why don't you make a statue to remember them, man, it's no problem. So people made statues. So when later on, few generations later, when people forgot why was the statue made, Satan inspired, ah, these statues are of God. And that's how idol worship started. So I do agree with Acharya Prashant that it is a door, but not a door to worship God. It's a door to worship false gods. Or it's a door, exit door for worshipping true gods. Or an entrance door for worshipping false god. And regarding that don't people keep the photograph of the children close to their chest or close to the heart. I wouldn't say that everyone who loves someone makes an idol of photo of the person he loves. And I don't agree that everyone holds the photograph close to the chest or close to the heart because he loves. This is seen more in the Hindi movies. If you see Hindi movies in Bollywood, many a times you will see that, you know, the, the, the hero or the heroine, you know, when they miss someone or they, they put the photograph close to the chest. Okay. Maybe some human being, but to say that all the human beings do that is totally wrong. So, I do agree with Acharya Prashant that this is a door to worshipping false god. And as it is rightly said, in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20, it says, all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. That means the materialistic people, they worship the false god. So, so Acharya Prashant never replied, if what he says is right, that means the Vedas are wrong, that means the Upanishads are wrong, that means the Bhagavad Gita is wrong. <clears throat> so, hypothetically, I agree with Acharya Prashant, whoever he is, that you can make an image of God, that means the Veda is wrong, Veda says Natya Sipati Masti, that means the Upanishad is wrong, of that God there is no image. So, when the Vedas and the Upanishads, the highest scriptures of Hinduism say that God has got no image and you're making an image of God, that means you're going against your scriptures. So you have to say in your talk that Upanishad is wrong, Veda is wrong, and you start a new religion, I have no problem. But you saying you're preaching Hinduism and then saying according to Hinduism, photograph is or, or idol is or door to worshipping God is totally wrong. If you ask the scholars of Hinduism to compromise what they say, that we agree that in the Hindu scriptures, in the Vedas, in the Upanishad, making idols is prohibited. Photographs of God is prohibited. But what happens that at the initial level, at the lower consciousness, you may require this thing to worship God. But once you reach a higher consciousness, then idol is not required to worship God, photograph is not required. So this is in the beginning stages we are using some support like how to walk, you may require a stick. But once you reach higher consciousness, it's not required. This is the explanation they give. So I tell them that if you agree that for higher consciousness, what the Veda says is right, that you don't require an idol or a photograph to worship God, we Muslims have already reached that higher consciousness. And in Islam, we believe that Almighty God, you cannot see God in this world. Now, the human beings cannot see. Inshallah, maybe in the Akhira when you go to Jannah and if you enter Jannah, we will crave to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the Acharya is not answering my question. He is taking you somewhere else and giving some his own philosophy. So, as per the Hindu scriptures, idol worship is prohibited. And if you believe that you are a person who follows the Vedas and, Upan and the Upanishad, you should stop idol worship. And you should worship the true one God who has no images, no photograph, no sculpture, no painting.
the question that continues. The second short video is on the topic amino acids in vegetables. You said there is no vegetable which has all eight or nine essential amino acids in it, but in non-veg food, all amino acids are present. All the essential amino acids are present. Acharya Prashant replies that falsehood is being spread. Who says there is no amino acid in the vegetables? Amino acids in the animals have also, have also come from vegetables. Animals are not producing amino acids on their own. Non-veg food has become very expensive. He's picking up a small portion, and I saw this video. What Acharya Prashant has done, he's picked up a small clip of my long answer on regarding non-veg food. That eating non-veg food is not prohibited, trying to explain to them. And I've and had a debate also on this topic. Is non-veg in food permitted or prohibited for a human being? So he picks up a short part of my answer, small portion, where I say that in vegetables, all the nine amino acids are not present. But in the non-veg food, all the nine amino acids are present. And we come to know from science that there are about 20 to 22 amino acids, out of which nine are called as essential amino acids. These nine amino acids are not produced by the human body or are produced in a lesser quantity, less than what's required. So it has to be taken in the external diet. So for a human being to be very healthy, these, out of these 22 amino acids, there are 20 or 20, I'll come to it later on, actually there are 20 amino acids. There are one or two which are not required by the human beings, but the total number of, um, total number of, uh, total number of amino acids are 22. One or two are not required. But most of them are produced by the human body. There are nine which are not produced by the human body or produced less. It has to be taken in the external diet or in the food for you to be very healthy, and these essential amino acids are nine. There is another category of conditional amino acids. There are six. Conditional amino acid means if you have a disease, for example, if you have a liver problem, then certain amino acids cannot be produced. So there are six amino acids which are called as conditional essential amino acids. Those nine which are not produced are produced in a very small quantity are called as essential amino acids. There are nine in number. Then the additional six Conditional essential amino acid means if you have a problem, if you are unhealthy, if you have a liver problem, then one is required, you may have some other health problems. So in these cases, there are additional six amino acids which may be required in certain conditions. They are called as conditional essential amino acids. And the remaining, that are seven, they are called as non-essential amino acids non-essential amino acids because they are produced by the human body and they are not required from the external diet even if there is a problem in health. So what I was saying in the lecture, I mean very various reasons why non-veg is not allowed, various reasons. One of them I say that the non-veg food, almost all the non-veg food, they are complete protein food. Complete protein means all the nine essential amino acids are present. As far as vegetables are concerned, the vegetables, they don't have all the nine amino acids, all the nine essential amino acids. So almost all the vegetables, almost all the vegetarian food, there may be exceptions, they are not complete protein. Complete protein means all nine amino acids should be present. I'm aware that there are some vegetarian food for example, soya bean or quinoa. There are some vegetables like soya bean, but soya bean is actually beans or their seed, they may not be called as vegetables. So when I say there's no vegetables, you didn't count soya as a vegetable. But if someone says they are vegetables, they have got no objection because they come in the vegetable kingdom. So for a holistic reply, 
I would say that almost all of the vegetarian food, whether it be vegetables, whether it be beans, whether it be seeds, almost all, that means 99%, they are not complete protein. They have some of the amino acids, but they don't have all the nine essential amino acids. Some of them, like soya bean, which is a bean, or you call it a seed, you want to call it a vegetable, I've got no objection. They have essential, and one example is tofu. Tofu is made of soya bean. It has all the nine essential amino acids. Or you have quino, that also has all the nine. And there is something like buckwheat or amaranth. These have in small quantities nine, but hardly you can count them on your fingertips. So in percentage wise, it's less than one percent. So you can say almost all. If anything is more than 95%, you can use the word almost all. In here, I could say the more than 99%. Almost all of the vegetarian food, they are not complete protein. They don't have all the nine amino acids. They may have some of them. So to have a complete food, you can mix few vegetables together and then have a complete food. Or some exceptions like soya bean or quinoa. These are there. But if you compare to the non-vegetarian food, whether it be beef, whether it be poultry products, whether it be chicken, whether it be eggs, whether uh, it be milk products, whether it be mutton, all of them, they are complete protein. So almost all of the non-veg food or the flesh food, whether it be fish, whether it be prawns, they are complete protein. They have all the nine essential amino acids in it. So I was trying to prove in this answer one of the additional reasons why non veg should not be prohibited and should be allowed. It's complete protein. That means if you want, a complete protein means it's good for building your muscles. So I was trying to prove that why you say that non veg is prohibited. And I say in the answer that a Muslim can be a very good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. There's no verse in the Quran or the Hadith that you should have non veg or you should have mutton or beef or fish, it's not compulsory. So Muslim can be a very good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. But since Almighty Allah, since Almighty God has given us permission, what's the harm? So Acharya doesn't reply to this, but he says that in the vegetable, there are amino acids. And I agree, I never said they don't have. What I said that almost all the vegetables don't have all the essential amino acids. And then he says that the animals also, they get the amino acid, they don't produce on their own, they eat the vegetables. Of course, they produce on their own also and they eat the both. He is not a man of science. And then uh, he goes on to say in the ending that animals are not producing amino acids on their own, non veg food has become, has become expensive. So that's no argument that because non veg food is expensive, you should not have it. If suppose I say that mango you know, and the good quality Alfonso mango where I come from, from the village of Nagiri, it's very expensive. So that doesn't mean it becomes prohibited to have a very expensive food. Okay, if you can't afford it, don't have it. But you cannot say it's prohibited. And he doesn't answer my complete answer of non veg He picks up one portion and just comments on it and after that there's laughter. The next video of his, and I'm repeating the main question again, that I'm Santosh from Mumbai, India. I'm a Hindu and a businessman. I've watched many of your videos on YouTube since many years. Recently, there are short videos released on YouTube replying to your talks by Acharya Prashant. I'm quoting three most popular answers, which prove that your speech is wrong. Can you reply to them? And, and I've given the answer to the first two videos. The third video is titled, Veg vs. Non-Veg. Chadda Phardo. Chadda Pardo meaning tear your shorts or underwear. And the question continues. Where you said the carnivorous animals eat only flesh and do not eat vegetables and have canine teeth which are pointed. Whereas herbivorous animals eat only vegetables and do not eat flesh, have molo teeth which are flat teeth. Human beings have flat as well as pointed teeth. They are molar as well as canine teeth. If God wanted us to have only vegetables, then why did he give us canine teeth, which are pointed, but natural to our non-wish food? And then in that video, 
it says the acharya prashant replies this is ignorance ye jahalat hai stop giving examples lion roams naked then why do you not roam naked all those who speak about non veg should remove your underwear and shorts if lion have canine pointed teeth have you ever seen a lion wear chadda meaning a lion wear wearing shorts or trousers first tear the chadda shorts and trousers then they laughter i saw this video and in this video he showed a clipping of mine part of it again part of mansur and then this and and you know that i've given this answer in detail in my talk on why muslims have non veg food and i've given various reasons one of the reasons i've given is that if you analyze the set of teeth of the herbivorous animals cow goat sheep they only eat vegetables they don't eat non veg they have got flat molar teeth if you analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animals who like lion tiger leopard they only eat flesh they don't touch grass they don't touch vegetables they have pointed teeth they have carine set of teeth but if we see the set of teeth we human beings have in the mirror we have pointed teeth canine teeth as well as flat teeth molar teeth if almighty god wanted us to have only non veg or only veg if almighty god wanted us to have only vegetables then why did he give us this canine teeth pointed teeth it's useless so but natural almighty god who created us gave us the canine teeth to have non veg it's a simple logical argument there are various other replies i give this is one of the argument acharya prashant doesn't reply to this and he goes and he says that yes when you see the teeth of the lion it is pointed because in non veg but have you seen that the lion doesn't even wear chadda that means shorts or trousers so all those who say that because lion has canine teeth and they are vegetarian because they have canine teeth then they should also remove the chadda and everyone start laughing this is an illogical argument acharya prashant doesn't realize he's not i don't think so he has a background of science in science when we do research we do research on animals so that we see what is the impact so that we can use that same research for treatment in the human beings whether it's the diet system of the animals whether it's a guinea pig whether it's a rat we do research so when we are talking about eating because canine teeth because canine teeth are required to eat so it's a logical scientific argument that when you have a look at the herbivorous animals they only eat grass they don't touch flesh they have flat molar teeth the carnivorous animal which only touch flesh they only eat flesh they don't eat grass they have pointed teeth we human beings have both canine and molar teeth pointed teeth and flat teeth we are omnivorous it's a logical argument what has the genital organ got to do with eating so he is trying to win the argument illogically by saying don't the people who eat non veg see that the lions who are carnivores don't wear chaddis so we need to move a chaddi and everyone start to laugh he is actually digging his own grave his argument is illogical but if i agree with his illogical argument that if you are carnivores because a lion has pointed teeth you have pointed teeth a lion doesn't wear chaddas you should remove a chadda if you agree with this argument you are digging your own grave You look at the herbivorous animal. Look at the cow. Look at the goat. Even don't even wear chaddas. Even these herbivorous animals don't wear chaddas. So why are you wearing clothes? Even you remove your clothes. So the laughter goes back to him. It's an illogical argument that shows that this person, Acharya Prashant, is such an illogical person. He is digging his own grave. If he is trying to point a finger at my argument. and saying that if those people who say that you are eating non veg because you have canine teeth because a lion has a lion doesn't wear clothes even you don't wear clothes 
what has clothes covering of genital got to do with eating? But if I agree with his illogical argument, he falls in the trap that he agrees with the argument. Okay, fine, you follow first. You have to remove your clothes because the herbivorous animal, the cow and the goat whose teeth resemble, and if you say the clothes should resemble, you should be the first person to take out your clothes. Anyway, I will not give this argument to him because I am aware that there are certain Hindu sects, there are certain giant sects who believe in removing the clothes. They say the best way, you know, to present ourselves to God, we want to renounce the world. And I know many Jains who walk around naked for miles together. This is their philosophy. And we know that before Islam came to Arabia, before Islam was spread in Makkah, in the pre-Islamic times in Makkah, the Arabs they did tawaf, circumambulation on the Kaaba naked. They had a logic that how can we present ourselves to Almighty God better than the way we came in the world. So they used to do the circumambulation, the tawaf around the Kaaba absolutely naked. But history tells us that there are different times for gents and different times for females. So this is no argument at all. Yet today, just for information, I would like to inform Acharya Prashant that yes, there are some human beings who behave like animals. So you have nude beaches. If you go to America and some western countries, they do behave like animals, even where sex is concerned. So what do they do? They go on the beach without clothes. So this you can compare very well, that this is a simile giving that they are behaving like animals. They should not do that. We are human beings. We know what is logical and what we should cover, what we should not cover. So in Islam, Islam has a system of hijab, which I have discussed in detail. What is the hijab for a man? What is the hijab for a woman? Discuss in detail. So, if you, my answer is wrong, what I am trying to tell the people scientifically, you cannot say non veg is prohibited. And I had a debate on this topic, that is non vegetarian food, permitted or prohibited for a human being. And there was a person by the name Rashmi Bhai Zaveri. He was a Jain. He was the president of the Vegetarian Congress of India. President means the highest authority. There is a Vegetarian Congress in India and he is supposed to be very knowledgeable and he has debates and give lectures to promote vegetarianism. Once he comes to my office in Bombay, maybe in the late 1990s, and he challenges me that you are a Muslim and you always have non-veg, let's have a debate on whether non-veg is right or wrong. It is like, you know, Abel Mujay Mar, as though he is inviting trouble. So I told him, who will come for the debate? No, no, I will call many non-Muslims, they will come. I said, okay. So we hired a hall and there were more than a thousand people that gathered. And we had a debate on this topic, is non-vegetarian food permitted or prohibited for a human being. And he called his friend, who was also a Jain, his name was Trivedi, he was a very senior lawyer in the Supreme Court. So he was one of the chairmen from his side, and my brother was from my side as the chairman, we are two chairmen. And Rashmi Bhai Zaveri goes to prove in this debate, the topic was, is non veg food permitted or prohibited for a human being? Oh, vegetarian is so much benefit, there is so much of loss in the, you know, the non-veg food and there are so many benefits with the vegetarian food, it is cheap and it is nutritious and blah 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 blah. And the full debate was vegetarian food is better. When I, so he spoke for about one hour, I spoke for one hour or it was 40 minutes or 50 minutes. When I got up, I started my talk, my presentation by saying that if someone proves that apple is better than a mango, that does not mean mango is prohibited to be eaten by the human beings. And after the debate, when his friend, uh, who was senior lawyer, Trivedi, he phoned me, he said, Dr. Zakir, your first statement of your talk, that if someone proves that apple is better than mango, doesn't mean that mango is prohibited for a human being. You won the debate. You slaughtered him. And believe me, his friend was the chairman. He said, you slaughtered him. 
And he told me that I would not, though I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not an ideological vegetarian. I would not like to have, I would love to have dinner or lunch with you and maybe have non-wish together. And then I said that since I have one hour, I would like to end the debate and I gave my various reasonings why non-wish food should be permitted for a human being. And I gave yes, there are times when non-wish, eating excessive non-wish food, eating excessive red meat, it is harmful for the body. That doesn't mean it should be prohibited. And Islam prohibits a thing which is in general harmful for most of the human beings. If you have diabetes and if you have sugar, then sugar is harmful for you. But I will not make sugar haram or prohibited for all the human beings. I would say if you have diabetes, don't have sugar. Like for example, we know, science tells us, that alcohol generally, when it is taken by human beings in large quantities, or when you start in small quantity, high chance you get addicted, it is harmful. According to WHO, World Health Organization, every year more than 3 million people are dying because of alcoholism. So Islam has prohibited alcoholism. Smoking. Today science and medical science tells us, according to WHO, more than 6 million people are dying because of tobacco, because of smoking. So Islam prohibits smoking. So if generally it is harmful for most of the human beings, generally you prohibit it, if it's harmful for a particular case, if you have a disease, you can't make it banned. And my lecture continued. And my point, because Acharya Prashant is a Hindu, I give references from the Hindu scripture, which he didn't touch on. I said clearly in the reply that why Muslims have non witch And I said that even if you do the Hindu scripture, If you read the Hindu scripture, the saints and the sages in the olden days, they had non witch If you read the Hindu scripture, the Manusmriti, chapter number 5, verse number 30, it says that if a person eats the animal, eat the flesh of the animal, which is supposed to be eaten, he's not, he's not committing a crime. It further mentioned in Manusmriti, chapter number 5, verse number 31, that God has created some animals to eat and some animals to be eaten. If you eat the animals which God has created to be eaten, you're not committing a sin. It's further mentioned in Manusmriti, chapter number 5, verse number 39 and 40, that God has created sacrificial animals for sacrifice. So killing in sacrifice is not killing. That means according to Manusmriti, eating non-veg is not prohibited. Further, if you read the Mahabharata, Anushasan Parv, 88, chapter number 88, when the Pandavas, the five brothers are discussing, Yudhishthar, the eldest brother, he asks, he asks Bhishma that what should we give in Yagna, like the ceremony for the dead, what should we give in Puja, you know, to, so that our ancestors are satisfied. So Bhishma replies that if you give fruits, rice, barley, our pitris, our ancestors will be satisfied for one month. If for the yagna, if for the ceremony of the dead, for the shraddha, if you give fish, our ancestors will be satisfied for two months. If you give mutton, they will be satisfied for three months. If you give the flesh of the hare, of the rabbit, they'll be satisfied for four months. If you give the flesh of the goat, they'll be satisfied for five months. If you give bacon, they'll be satisfied for six months. If you give the flesh of birds, they'll be satisfied for seven months. For six months, sorry. Uh, uh, the fruits, vegetables is one month, fish is two months, mutton is three months, hair is four months, goat is five months, bacon is six months. If you give the flesh of birds, they'll be satisfied for six months. If you give the flesh of deer, they'll be satisfied for eight months and the menu continues. And it says that if you give buffalo, our ancestors will be satisfied for 11 months. And if you give beef, they'll be satisfied for one full year. And if you give rhinoceros, the flesh of rhinoceros, they'll be satisfied inexhaustibly. There's a big menu. What non-veg you want? Fish, mutton, 
rabbit, deer, bird, everything is there. So how can you say that eating non-veg for a Hindu is prohibited? It's clearly mentioned in Mahabharat, Anushasan Parv, chapter number 88. A big menu is mentioned. I'm giving you the reference. Further, if you read Raman, Ayodhya Khanda, book number 2, chapter number 20, verse number 29. When Ram is sent on Banwas you know, for 14 years, so Ram tells his mother Kaushalya that I have to sacrifice my luxuries. I have to sacrifice my meat dishes. And I have to survive on roots, on fruits and honey. So when he says he has to sacrifice his meat dishes, that means Ram is to have meat. He should have non-veg. So when Ram can have non-veg, the Pandavas can have non-veg. So why can't the Hindus have non-veg? So I'm going to prove from the Hindu scriptures. That is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures, in Manusmriti, in Mahabharat, in Ramayan. That the sages, the religious people, they had mutton, they had even beef. So he is not replying to these things and he's telling that lions are not wearing clothes, so remove your clothes. Illogical. And there's laughter. So surely, and now what I've seen, that there are many videos. Many non-Muslims, they take my video and they give some reply, which is illogical, but the views reach hundreds of thousands, even millions. You have the videos, maybe six, seven, of Sadhguru taking my lecture, part of it out of context, and he gives a reply, and the videos reach millions. And one of his followers told me, why don't you debate with Jaggu Vasudeva? And I said, no problem, he's a popular person, and you know that one of my requirements is that if he's very popular, since I can get more than a million people live from my audience, anyone who can get at least 20,000 individuals for his lecture, I wouldn't mind debating him. And Jaggu Vasudev has a large following. Surely for his lecture, tens of thousands of people come. But he didn't accept. So surely I tell that all, and now you find many Hindus making a video. So these are mainly those who write articles or those who have in the social media. I call them paper tigers. So surely because I'm there, the likes and the viewership in the video reaches 100,000, maybe million. There are many non-Muslims who get my video and reply something illogically, but the views reach millions and they become famous and they get money. There are even non-Muslims who are not against Islam. What they do, that they take my video and they give comments on my video. So you may find a foreigner gent or a foreigner lady, they give comments on my video, not against me. Most of them are in my favor. And even they have millions of views. So it's a common trend now that someone who's popular, you take his video and you comment on it and you get millions of views. That's a good way of becoming popular. If it's helping the society come closer to the truth, I have no problem. The many non-Muslims who give comments on my video, I have no problem. Most of them are good. So I'm not against them. If they're doing for popularity, no problem. If they're doing for getting ads, I have no problem. If they're doing to spread the truth, I have no problem. But these people, who manipulate and take part of my video and give part of the answer and give illogical replies and people start viewing them, surely they make a laughing stock of themselves. So there are many such videos and I, I avoid replying to them because they are so illogical. Anyone who has the basic sense of logic will realize that such answers are just to get a viewership for their video so that they get ads, so that they make money, so that they become famous. But since the question came and it was selected, I replied to the three short videos that the Hindu has requested me. Hope that answers the question. We have uh, on the Facebook. Uh, 
I'm trying to see where are the comments. I could not get the comments and I found it. There are many people commenting on my Facebook. We have Sara Khatun, Swapnil Sa Sapnu, Love from Bangladesh, Aumi, Shamim Reza, Muhammad S, Rasil Ahmad, Yasin Jani. Kausar Ahmed, Muhammad Ariful Islam, Muhammad Ali Nasuka, Rabia Farha, Habib Zaberi, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam, I love you, I love you too, Muhammad Ali Nasuka, I love you, I love you too. A Prince Maxis. There is Princess Max, Maximus, salam wa alaikum wa alaikum salam, from an uh, English revert Muslim from London. I accepted Islam 18 years ago. Of course, it's Allah who made my heart accept Islam. But when I was 20 and young and never knew Islam, it's Dr. Zakir Naik who made me accept Islam. This man made me accept Islam as I studied Dr. Zakir Naik for two years. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you through the truth. I, Aumi, love you sir, love you sir, love you sir. Shamim Reza, I am from Bangladesh. Swapnil Saha Sapnu, Sara Khatun, Jangir Alam, Bilal Abu Bakr, Mashallah, may Allah grant you Janitor Firdos, Ameen. Sayar Afghan, Khoka Babu, Safwan Ahmed, Muhammad Iftikar, you are legend, dear Dr. Zakir, sir. SR Sahib, Princess Maximus, I would love to talk to Dr. Zakir Naik as he was man who made me accept Islam 18 years ago. If from London, I am. If you read his, this brother Zakir Naik, then accept me. It would be an honor to talk to you as a brother. Inshallah, brother Maxim, Maximus, if you can send your uh, uh, send your WhatsApp number, I'll ask someone to note it down. And inshallah, maybe very soon after the program tomorrow or day after tomorrow, I'll speak to you. Inshallah, brother Maxim. <coughs> Asad Khan from Pakistan. Arafat Islam is watching. Kaif Ansari, Eagle Eye, Ahmed Hassan, Mujahid Islam, Haider Muhammad, Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam, Hamza Mahmood, love from Ethiopia, Oliver Rahman, Muhammad Wahidul Islam, Musa Kontek, Ali Bilal, love from Nepal, Rabiul Islam, Mal Boresi. We also have many people on the YouTube. Fahmida Nasrina Rima. Pantaru Leo. Khairi Yusuf. Tarikul Islam. Aksa Fatima. Bongo Bondo. Fahmida Nasrin Rima. I'm from Bangladesh. 
गेब्रियल रियास अस्सलाम वालेकुम वालेकुम सलाम फहमीदा नसरीन रिमा तोहिद चौधरी मरजुक साजिद पंथेरा लियो डॉक्टर जाकिर इज वन ऑफ द बेस्ट कॉलर ऑफ मॉडर्न टाइम मरजुक साजिद हसनैन सामी सैयद मोहम्मद कैश हजरत समीर खान प्रो गेमिंग अब्दुल्ला समीर खान स्टीफ वाई के टेन मोहम्मद उबैदुल्ला ऑल ऑफ देम सिंग सलाम डू दुआस वालेकुम असल वरक़ सुबहान तलगी विद द बेस्ट इन दिस वाल आखिर So the question asked by Osama Lapiop: How resurrection works on a person when he is burned or the body ate by sharks? This is the question asked by Osama that we know that in Islam the day of resurrection and all the human beings will be resurrected on the day of resurrection. So the question is that if a person has died because of burning, his body is completely burned, or if he is eaten by shark. then how will he be resurrected on the day of judgment and a similar question is asked by the non believers in the quran in surah qiyamah chapter number 75 verse number 3 4 5 6 <laughs> and when they ask in surah qiyamah chapter number 75 verse number 4 onwards that how will allah subhanahu wa taala be able to reconstruct our bones you know after we have been buried and our bones have been disintegrated how will allah subhanahu wa taala be able to reconstruct our bone so allah replies and says we can not only reconstruct the bones we can reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger so allah replies that when the unbelievers say when we are buried when our bones are got disintegrated how will allah be able to resurrect us so allah replies we can not only reconstruct the bones we can reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger so what does allah mean by saying he can not only reconstruct the bones he can reconstruct in very in perfect order the very tips of the finger it was in 1880 that sir francis galton he discovered fingerprinting method and sir francis galton in 1880 he discovered and he told the world that no two fingerprints even in a million people are, are identical the fingerprints of each individual human being differs that is the reason the police the cid uh the cia as well as the fbi to identify criminals they use the fingerprinting method whenever there is a crime if you want to come to know who has come to rob or who committed murder we check the fingerprints imagine what we discovered recently hardly about 150 years back the fingerprinting method allah mentions in the quran 1400 years ago that he can not only reconstruct the bones he can reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger so this even goes irrespective whether a person dies by burning to death or whether he drowns or whether he is killed or eaten by a shark allah subhanahu wa taala on the day of judgment can reconstruct in very in perfect order the very tips of your finger so for allah it's very easy allah says kun fa kun bi anitas so allah who has created us 
for him to reconstruct on the day of resurrection, irrespective of whether you have died because of burning or sharks have eaten you or your bones have been disintegrated, for Allah to do that is very easy. Hope that answers the question. There's a question posed by Fidis Kam Fructis on the YouTube. Dr. Zakir Naik, if the Bible is corrupted, how come can still find Muhammad in the Bible, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How come only those few chapters are not corrupted? The question posed by the brother is that if Bible is corrupted, how come the prophecies of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bible are correct. So do you mean to say only those few chapters are correct? No. Corrupted means, corruption means there is some mistakes in the Bible, there is some addition, there is some concoction, there is the interpolation. That does not mean 100% is wrong. Corruption means the Bible has been interpolated. The, there has something addition been done. So whether the addition corruption can be 10%, can be 20%, can be 30%, depending upon the percentage of corruption, the remaining remains quiet. So as far as the Muslims are concerned, we consider the Quran to be a Furqan, the criteria to judge right from wrong. So if whatever is mentioned in the Bible, it matches with the Quran or matches with the Islamic Sharia or the Sahih Hadith, we say we have no problem in accepting this portion of the Bible has to be the word of God. Those portions in the Bible which go against the Quran or against the information which is mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, we say that this portion is surely wrong. We do not agree this can be the word of God, this, in, this is an interpolation, this is a fabrication, this is a corruption. Now third, there may be certain portions in the Bible which may not go against the Quran or the Sahih Hadith may not agree with the Quran or Sahih Hadith. So this goes in the ambiguous slot. May be right, may be wrong. So the present Bible that we have can be divided into three parts. Those parts which match the Quran, we say we have no problem it, in considering this to be the word of God. It may not be the word of God also, but if we have no problem because it matches with the Quran, or it may be the word of God because it matches with the Quran. If it is against the Quran and Sahih Hadith, as Allah says, I have revealed the Quran. I shall guard it from corruption. We know that the Quran is 100% the word of God. So if something in the Bible which, which goes against the Quran, we can say for sure this is not part of the original Bible or the original word of God. If something neither agrees with the Quran or disagrees with the Quran, we put it in the ambiguous lot. Maybe that may be wrong. So those portions in the Bible which talk about Tawheed, we say we have no problem in accepting this portion as the word of God. Those parts which talk about the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verse number 18. Gospel of John chapter 14, verse number 16. And all these. We have no problem in accepting word, the word of God. Those portions of the Bible which say the alcohol is prohibited in matches of the Quran, we have no problem in accepting it to be the word of God. Those portions of the Bible which say that that the eating the flesh of son is prohibited. Book of Life Takers, chapter number 17, verse number 15. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8. We have no problem in accepting this portion to be the word of God. So like that, I've given the talk on similarities between Islam and Christianity. So all the portion in the Bible, which matches with the Quran and the Say Hadith, we as Muslims have got no objection in accepting it to be the word of God. It can be possible that some of the things which are mentioned in the Quran you know, also be an interpolation in the Bible, no problem. So what we say, we don't mind accepting it, it as the word of God based on our Furqan, the Quran. But surely those portions which go against the Quran and against the Hadith, we say this is not part, we don't agree with it. And which is ambiguous, may be right, may be wrong. So this is how we approach when we read the scriptures of the other religions, that if it matches with the Furqan, the criteria of the Quran, we have no problem in accepting it the word of God. If it goes against, we reject it. If it's ambiguous, 
neither saying yes, neither saying no, neither matching the Quran, neither speaking against the Quran, it's ambiguous, maybe that may be wrong. Hope that answers the question. The next question, I am Farana from Dhaka. Assalamu alaikum sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. If a husband says three talaq at a time, is it considered one talaq or three talaq according to Quran and Sunnah? Can the husband marry his divorced wife again? So please reply, it's very urgent. So your speech may save my life. Please reply, I am very helpless sir. My husband showed your audio clip on talaq to the imam but he said that was your earlier speech at present you are not delivering such speech you are following madhab there is another similar question assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh manzoor sheikh from karachi pakistan a businessman some muftis met you personally in malaysia and after discussing with you, say that now you have stopped giving fatwas like before and only speak on comparative religion. Is it true? <clears throat> I'll first answer the question on talaq and then come to the second part of the question or the second question regarding what are the imams or the mufti say. The question posed by the sister is that if husband gives three talaq together, is it counted as three talaq or is it counted as one? When you give three talaq together. There are three types of talaq that are prevalent in the Muslim society and I have given this answer earlier in detail. I will just mention in brief. There are three types of talaq prevalent in the Muslim society. One, when a person gives three talaq together in one sitting, say talaq, 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 or say I've divorced you three times. I've given talaq three times. This is called as talaq e bidah. A talaq which is an innovation. The second type of talaq is talaq e hasan. A man gives divorce to his wife and waits for one monthly cycle, one menstrual cycle. Then after that gives the second talaq, then waits for a second men menstrual cycle, then gives the talaq the third time. This is called as talaq e hasan. That means a good type of talaq. And the third type is talaq e hasan. That is the best type of talaq as per the Quran and Sunnah. And a person gives, a husband gives talaq to his wife and waits for three menstrual cycle and after that the talaq is complete. Now regarding the question that if a husband gives three talaq together saying talaq, talaq, talaq or I have divorced you three times is it counted as one talaq or it's counted as three talaq? This is the main question. And we know Quran gives the description in great detail from Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 228 to Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 232. And Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 228 that when you give divorce you wait for three menstrual period the idda period is for three menstrual period and verse number 229 says that divorce is only permissible twice the third time you give it's irrevocable that means you cannot do ruju after that and verse number 30 says 230 sorry Bakra chapter 2 verse number 230 says that if you give irrevocable divorce, that means if you give talaq three times, then you cannot marry the husband. Same, you have to marry another person and if that person gives talaq, then you can marry the former husband. So now, there are three types of talaq as I mentioned prevalent, prevalent in the Muslim society. Regarding the first type of talaq, that if you give talaq together in one setting, talaq, 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 or say I have divorced, 
I've given talaq three times together. Is it counted as one or counted as three talaq? According to all the four ahimmas, the fatwas of all the four ahimmas, Imam, uh, according to Imam Abu Hanifa, according to Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, all four schools of thought, they say that if three talaqs are given at one time, or if triple talaq is said three times together, it is counted as three talaq and it is irrevocable. So as far as the fatwa of the four imams are concerned, there is an ijma in the four imams. All the four schools of thought, the Hanafi school of thought, the Maliki school of thought, the Shafi school of thought, and the Hanbali school of thought, all four, all four schools of thought, they unanimously agree that if a husband in Islam gives three divorces together, saying talaq, 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 or a divorce with three times, it is counted as three talaq and it is irrevocable. That's ijma. And when you ask the scholars of these former dhai, and they give the reply that they say that if it is not correct to kill an innocent human being, to fire, to shoot with a gun, an innocent human being is prohibited. But if someone shoots, the person dies. You know, so most of the, many of the Maulanas in India, Pakistan, they give this logic that goli marna masum ko haram hai. Likin goli mare to insan mar jata hai. So killing an innocent person is prohibited in Islam. But if you shoot at an innocent person, he will die. The same way, giving triple talaq is prohibited. You should not give. It's not correct. But if you give, divorce takes place. And it's irrevocable. So my argument with these, with this answer is that Maulana, we are not asking you whether killing innocent human being is allowed or not. We know it's haram. We are asking you that if you shoot and if the bullet inside is true or fake, if it's a bullet which is true, the person will die. If it's a fake bullet, the person will not die. So our question is, is the bullet fake or true? So when we say giving triple talaq, is it the correct method according to Quran, Sunnah or not? We know that giving triple talaq together is wrong. But if you give triple talaq, does it constitute three talaq or one talaq? So if you shoot someone, the bullet in the gun, is it authentic or is it fake? If it's a fake, you don't need to hear a loud voice, but no one will die. It is a dummy bullet. Come to the argument. So all the four madahib unanimously, they agree that if you give triple talaq in one sitting, it is counted as one. But according to many scholars, according to Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, and even according to Sheikh Asadi, they say that though all the four Ayyama say that triple talaq is counted as three, they say no, according to the authentic ruling, the more correct ruling is, it is counted as one. And for the evidence, they quote Hadith from Sahih Muslim. And they say, if you read Sahih Muslim, Volume number 4, Hadith number 3763. It says in this Hadith that Ibn Abbas, may Allah be peace with him, he said that during the times of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr, and two years of the Caliphate of Umar, May Allah be pleased with him. Three divorces were counted as one. But then, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said that people are doing haste in a thing in which they should take time. I will make them binding and make them accept it. So this hadith, which is a mock of hadith, it's a saying of Ibn Abbas, 
So it's a mock of hadith. There are actually four types of hadith. If the hadith reaches to the narrators and it goes the Saba, Saba says the Prophet said, and Prophet said, Allah says, that is the highest level hadith could see. The second is marfu hadith, the narrators go, it goes to the Saba, Saba said the Prophet said it, that's a marfu hadith. Then comes the mawkuf hadith, it goes to the Saba. And the Saba said it. The Tabain says Saba said it, the chain is correct. It's a mawkuf. And there's a last category called as maktu, means disconnected. It goes to the Tabain. So what the Tabain says, it is the fourth category hadith. So this is a mawkuf hadith, it's a call of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him. If in Sahih Muslim, and Sahih Muslim, all the hadith are authentic. Volume number four, hadith number seven, uh, hadith number 3763, that Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased said that during the period of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr, and two years of Umar's Caliphate, triple talaq was counted as one. But then Umar said, people are making haste in a thing which they should do they should take time in it i will make it binding on them what they say i will make it binding on them and make them adhere to it the next hadith of sahih muslim volume number four hadith number three seven six four says that ibn taus narrated from his father that Abu As-Sahaba said to Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, that is it not true that during the time of the Prophet and at the time of Abu Bakr and three years of Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, three talaq was counted as one and Ibn Abbas replied, yes, may Allah be pleased with him. Then another hadith, next hadith. Of Sahih Muslim, volume number four, hadith number 3765, which says that Ibn Taus said that Abu As-Sahaba said that the Ibn Abbas can you give us some information which is unique? And is it not true that during the time of the Prophet and Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him? Three divorces were counting as one. He said yes. But later on, Umar, he said that people were making haste in giving divorce. So I will make it binding on them, whatever they say. That means at the time of Umar, Umar said that three talaq will be counted as three and not as one. I'll make it binding on them. So according to Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, According to Sheikh Ibn Qayyim, according to Sheikh Asadi, and there are many scholars, they say that the view of the majority of the Sabas, like Ibn Abbas, Hazrat Ali may Allah be pleased with him, Abdul Rahman bin Auf, the majority of the Sabas, they believed in the view that triple talaq was counted as one talaq. And they say that there's also a hadith in Musnad Ahmad with a Jayyad is not which is with the Sahih chain where Ibn Abbas Malawi please with him he says that ar ranaq one of the Sabas he divorced his wife three times and then he regretted and he came to the Prophet so the Prophet said this three divorce is counted as one you can do ruju so there's a clear cut hadith at the time of the Prophet it is a Sahih hadith in Muslim Ahmad, that the Prophet, when one Saba gave his wife divorce three times, and the and the person regretted, he came back to the Prophet, and Prophet said, "It is counted as one divorce. You can do it." So, based on these evidences, according to many scholars, but but natural, the four schools of thought, all of the four schools of thought, all the Ahmads and the scholars, almost all of these four schools of thought. They agreed that triple talaq, if given in one sitting, is counted as three separate talaq. But according to Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, according to Ibn Qayyum, according to Sheikh Asadi, according to Sheikh Muhammad Saleh al-Utaymi, 
all of these scholars, according to Sheikh Nasser Dalbani, according to Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreel, all of them say that triple talaq giving in one sitting is counted as one talaq, and this is the opinion of Ibn Abbas and most of the majority of the Sabas, including the Tabain. And they quote Muhammad ibn Shaq or the Tabain, even according to them, triple talaq was counted as one. When this question was asked to Sheikh bin Bas, that if triple talaq is given in one setting, is it three talaq or is it one talaq? So he says that according to majority of the scholars, if triple talaq is given in one setting, it is counted as triple talaq. But according to the Saba, then he quoted the same hadith of Ibn Abbas or Sai Muslim. According to Ibn Abbas, triple talaq given in one setting is counted as one talaq. So he personally, though he says, that according to Ahmed ibn Hanbal, according to Hanbali Fiqh, in Saudi Arabia they follow Hanbali Fiqh and he was the Mufti, Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia. According to Hanbali Fiqh, triple talaq in one setting is counted as three talaq, but according to Quran and Sunnah, it is counted as one. So, I personally agree and believe that the right, the more correct opinion is given by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, ibn Qayyim, Shaykh al-Sadi, uh, uh, Shaykh al-Taymiyyah, Shaykh Abdullah ibn Jibreel, and Shaykh Nafsul al-Dalbani, and Shaykh bin Baz, I agree with that view. Because it's more closer to the Quran. Quran is very clear cut, as I mentioned earlier, in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 228, that when you give divorce, there should be three monthly period of it, idda. You can give divo divorce twice, but if you give three times, it's irrevocable. And the Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 230 that if an irrevocable divorce is given by the husband, he cannot take back his wife unless that woman marries somebody else and that husband divorces. But this should happen in the natural course. Today, you have many Maulanas who say no problem, we'll do halala. Halala means no problem, you have given triple divorce together. Okay, not triple divorce, you cannot go back to your husband. No problem. I will do nikah with you, I will sleep with, sleep with you one night, I will divorce you, then you can go and marry your former husband. This is haram. Planning such a thing, planning such a halala, it is haram. You cannot plan that, okay, now you are given triple talaq, you cannot go back to your former husband, you want to go back, I will sleep with you, I will have sex with you one night and then I will give you divorce. This is nothing but, it is legalized prostitution. What the Quran says under normal course of time if you give triple divorce. Then you cannot go back to your husband and if you marry somebody else and then under normal course if there is divorce. And all this should happen according to the way the Quran says. And the Quran is very clear cut in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 135 and onwards that if there is a problem with husband and wife, you have to appoint an arbiter, one from the wife's side, one from the husband's side, and try and solve the problem. If you cannot, then is the question divorce. And the procedure is given very clear cut. That the talaq ahsan, the talaq which is excellent, it you give divorce. And once you give divorce, it takes three monthly period for the divorce to get complete. During this time, if you do ruju, then you remain husband and wife. Your one chance of talaq is over. But yet, you continue as your husband and wife. But, if you don't continue, and maybe a, even a year has passed, and then if you decide, no, I made a mistake, I want to remarry, you can remarry. Quran is very clear cut. In Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 232, that if you have divorced your wife, and after that, if the woman wants to marry their former husband, do not prevent them. That means once you have divorced your wife in the right way, giving one divorce, wait for three months to seek it. And if they want to remarry, they can remarry, but since they no longer husband and wife, the three menstrual period is over. Maybe they want to marry after one year or two years, then there is new nikah, new mare, but you can remarry. That is second time. Again, if there is a problem, again if you part, According to the right authentic way, give talaq, wait for three months to cycle. If you don't do ruju, after three months you cease to be husband wife. Yet after two years, you want to remarry, you can remarry. But 
second time is permitted if you give the third time then this irrevocable you cannot take her back because maximum you can give talaq three times then under normal circumstances if you marry somebody else and then if that new husband divorces then if you want to return back it's permitted this is clearly mentioned in the quran in surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 230 so based on this coming to the basic question that if you give talaq in three sitting if you give talaq in one sitting talaq 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 is it counted as one or three i agree more with the view of sheikh al islam ibn taymiyah sheikh bin ba sheikh nasir bani sheikh sadi with this group though they are minority i do agree that the majority all the four madhab they say that three is counted as one but i believe that as per the quran and sunna the opinion of sheikh al islam or you would say the opinion of the ahli hadith or the salafi scholars i agree with that now now coming to the question this was my reply and i have given this answer earlier maybe 10 years back or more and my answer remains the same now coming to the first question of the lady says when we showed my answer to an imam the imam says now dr zakir naik has changed and now is following a madhab I have not changed him the same of course alhamdulillah being in the field of of compared religion in the field of dawa in this few years of course my knowledge has increased alhamdulillah by allah's grace i keep on reading and meeting scholars and knowledge increasing the second question he posed from pakistan mansoor sheikh from pakistan that some muftis who met me say that now after dr zakir naik has gone to malaysia has done hijra to malaysia he has stopped giving fatwas and now is concentrating only on comparative religion i do agree that since i have shifted to malaysia alhamdulillah i am meeting multiple times number of more scholars because in india there were limited scholars from all over the world coming who wished to invite them to come but being in malaysia being the hub alhamdulillah whether it be english speaking scholars from all over the world i could say among the top leading english speakers dais maybe 10 may come once or twice in malaysia every year then you have scholars from pakistan coming here you have scholars from bangladesh coming so you have english scholars bangladeshi scholars urdu scholars and alhamdulillah many of them come to meet me and if i know that he is a scholar or if i know he is a mufti or if i know that he is a student of knowledge and if i know the knowledge of dawa irrespective whether the hanafi shafi hambali malki whether the salafi whether the jamaat e islami whether the tabligi i welcome them all with open hearts i respect a dai i respect a student of knowledge i respect a person who is a sheikh i respect a maulana i respect a mufti i love all unless if the deviated sect you know maybe she or akadiani that's different but if he's from al sunnah wal jamaat with the hanafi shafi hanbali malki with the jamaat islami with the is al hadith with the tabliki and i have scholars and duaats and students of knowledge from very different groups from very different countries and i welcome them all and when i meet this and the question is correct there are tens of mufti from india from pakistan from america from uk from bangladesh they regularly every year they come and meet me maybe allah has put love in their hearts some of them i know some of them are meeting the first time some i don't know at all some they say very popular I go on the youtube and i see oh mashallah he has millions of followers i never knew of them when i meet them i respect them i respect their view and i'm a good host to them regarding the first question and regarding the second question after dr zakir naik has shifted to malaysia he has changed he has stopped giving fatwas he is concentrating on islam and compact religion let me tell you very clearly never in my life have ever given fatwa on my own never i am a dai i am not a mufti i am not an expert or you could say that i don't call myself a person 
who's qualified to give individual fatwas. What I am, I am adai. A prophet said, Ballegu anni wala aya. Propagate even if to be one of us. What I do, I do my research and I analyze the fatwas given by various different scholars. I am specialized in Islam and comparative religion. I don't consider myself to be a scholar in fiqh, but I do consider myself to be a student of knowledge. And I do analyze. Now, what is the difference between when I was in India and when I did hijrah to Malaysia? There's a great difference and I agree with that. When I was in India, I used to give a lot of public lectures. And most of my lectures used to concentrate on non-Muslims. And secondly, on the educated Muslims trying to get them closer to Islam. And those less practicing Muslims getting closer to Islam. So most of my public lectures that you see, you could say on an average, 60% of my topics were focused exclusively for non-Muslims. And out of this majority, maybe 50% of my lectures were in Islam and comparative religion. For example, similarities between Islam and Christianity, similarities between Islam and Hinduism, uh, concept of God in Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the major world religious scriptures, religion in the right perspective, universal brotherhood. All these are hardcore lectures exclusively for non-Muslims talking about comparative religion, quoting the Bible, quoting the Vedas, quoting the Upanishad, quoting the Jewish scriptures and that is my speciality. So 60% of my lectures were exclusively targeted only for non-Muslims, out of which half of my lectures were exclusive lectures on Islam and comparative religion. Quoting, besides quoting the Quran and the Hadith, quoting the Bible, quoting the Vedas, quoting the Upanishad, quoting the Manusmriti, quoting the Mapad, quoting the Zadavesta, so on and so forth. And 10% of the lectures exclusive for non-Muslims may not be on comparative religion. For example, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? Concentrating on the non-Muslims, it may have very little of comparative religion, but it is talking to the non-Muslims. Such topics are there. So 60% of my talks were exclusively on comparative religion, mainly targeting exclusively the non-Muslim. But when I'm talking to the non-Muslim, my audience majority is Muslim. On average, 25% of my audience are non-Muslims, 75% are Muslims. When the Muslims are hearing my talk, even the talks which are exclusively meant for non-Muslims, they are getting guidance, they are getting knowledge how to do da'wah to a non-Muslim, which is one of the faraid of a Muslim. It is further on every Muslim to do da'wah. For you to go to Jannah according to Surah Al-Asar, one of the criteria is you should do da'wah. Besides doing the other faraid, da'wah is a fard. According to Surah Al-Asar, if you don't do da'wah under normal circumstances, you should not do Jannah. So the Muslims who hear my talk, number one, they get educated how to do da'wah with a Christian, with Hindu, with atheist. So some of my lectures are focused to atheist. Like is the Quran God's word. Compared to religion, say how to prove logically to an atheist the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So 60% of my lectures, though they were targeted only for non-Muslims, even the Muslims benefited. And it is unique. There are few duats like Sheikh Didat and very few who talk about comparative religion. Even today, you have thousands of English duat, but only a handful who speak on comparative religion. Only a handful. Sheikh Didat was number one. And after Sheikh Didat has gone, you hardly have any dais who speak on comparative religion. So this was my speciality. The remaining 30% of my talk was talking about the aspects of Islam, logically, which was meant for the Muslims and non-Muslims together. For example, Quran and modern science. When I speak about Quran and modern science, it is even inspiring a non-Muslim. MashaAllah, Islam is a modern religion. It talks about science and technology. Many things which scientists did not know. They came to know 200 years back, 300 years back. Quran is mentioned 14 years ago. So it inspires a Muslim to come closer to Islam. It even inspires a normal Muslim. MashaAllah, my religion is scientific. It's up to date. So 30% of my lecture were talking about Islamic aspects with reason, logic, science, like Quran, modern science, like women's rights in Islam. So all these topics are topics which are topics which is meant for Muslims and for non-Muslims both. 
talking about reason, logic and science. This is about 30% of my talk. The remaining 10% of my talk was exclusively meant for Muslims. So 90% of my talk was meant actually for non-Muslims, 60% exclusively for non-Muslims, but even the Muslims benefited, 30% both for Muslims and non-Muslims, both, like Quran, one science, women in Islam, uh, terrorism, uh, 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 an Islamic perspective, and various other talks. 10% were exclusively for Muslims only. For example, Al Quran, should it be read with understanding? Or Dawa and destruction? Or if the label shows your intent, where it? So these talks, about 10% of my topics, were exclusively only for Muslims. So my major talks were exclusively for non Muslims. That's 60%, which even the Muslim benefited. 30% were targeting both Muslims and non Muslims. So 90% of my talks were for non Muslims and for Muslims both. And out of which 50% was the Islam and compatible religion. And 10% were exclusively for Muslims. Now, after every talk, public talk of mine, I have to have open question answer session. So, in this question answer session also, the percentage of questions coming was somewhat similar. 50% questions were dealing with Islam and comparative religion. 90% of the questions were from non-Muslims, of which 50% were comparative religion. Other were on how to prove to an atheist about various aspects, you know. And even Muslims used to ask questions on the logical aspects of Islam, 30%. So 30% which was meant on logic, even Muslims asked, even non-Muslims asked. There was 10% of my questions which were dealing with issues of fiqh. But out of this, 99% were general issues. For example, riba is that allowed or not, I gave a talk on interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. There is no difference of opinion, it is fiqh. But no difference of opinion. I'll call it haram. I've given the answer. No difference of opinion. So 10% was on fiqh. But someone said, I'll call haram. I said, yes. And I have to give various reasons. So from this 10%, 99%, 90 percent of them, or 99% of it was, was not comparative fiqh. It was fiqh. Okay, is haram. I'll call it haram. I have to give answer with reason, logic. So the Muslim was happy. It was dealing only with Muslim. What to do? 1% from all my questions, less than 1% or 1% of 10%, that's 0.1% were dealing with comparative fic. And I hardly can quote 4 or 5 questions. One of them is, it's triple talaq counted as 1 or 3 and I gave this answer many years back, maybe 15 years back, 20 years back or before that, that no triple talaq is 1 talaq. This is comparative fic. If you ask me, how many questions on comparative fic have I answered? Before I came to Malaysia, you can count them on your fingertips. Two, three, maybe if a woman touches a man, does the voodoo break or not? Hanafi school of thought says it breaks. Shafi school of thought says it doesn't break. And the difference of opinion. And I believe more with Hanafi school of thought that the voodoo breaks. And I give my reason. So one is triple talaq, one is does the voodoo break or not? Hardly anything else. Two, three. If I think I'll get three, four. So other things don't fix, no one had a problem. I'll call it Haram, Hanafi says that, Shafi, Hamli, Malki, all say, interest Haram, everyone says, Pock is Haram, everyone says, it is fiqh. But general knowledge, there's no difference of opinion. So even in the question of fiqh, it was mainly fiqh, which no one disagreed with. There were few questions, Tarawi, is it eight rakat or twenty rakat? Now the opinion, eight rakat, the more correct, but even twenty you read, no problem. So hardly I can think of three, four questions. Now, when I did Hijra to Malaysia, those people who say that Dr. Zakir Naik has stopped giving fatwas, first of all, I never gave fatwas. Whatever I said was of the opinion of the scholars. And I would agree more and say this, I agree more authentic than the other. There was nothing except for three, four questions. But these three folk answers became so popular, especially on talaq, that those who believe in sticking to a madhab, they started getting, you know, oh, why Dr. Zaki and I give fatwas? How many fatwas are I given? Which fatwas have I said which are wrong? And they can hardly quote any. But when I came to Malaysia, but naturally, and I told that earlier, that the times changed. 
and uh, my dawa changed a lot. And one thing good that happened because of pandemic. In India, I never used to give online. Maybe one or two months, there was a talk in Pakistan. Once or twice, a short talk of half an hour I've given online. Once or twice, that's in my full life. When I came to Malaysia, I continued with that. We have to give lectures. But when pandemic came, I did Hijra to Malaysia in 2016 or 17. I have to give lectures. I went to Indonesia, Turkey. I gave lectures to continue. In 2018-19, I gave various lectures. I gave a large lecture in Marshall, Atlanta. More than 100,000 people came. In 2020, the pandemic came and all the public lectures were stopped. Inside Malaysia, outside Malaysia, I could not travel for two years. Then, I being a die what to do, we went online. And when we went online, we started this Ask Dr. Sakir. I remember the first time I came online was in 2020, in the month of Ramadan. It was, I think, April. And I used to handle twice a week. Tuesday and Saturday, for one and a half hour. And then I realized when it's to handle twice a week, I have to prepare, it takes about one day to select, choosing the question, a lot of time, you know, or twice a week is too much, then I made it once a week. So after Ramadan got over for one month, I handled for twice a week. When Ramadan got over, I continued every Saturday, as Dr. Zakir. After a few months, my son started joining me from Saudi Arabia. He was doing his bachelor's. So I used to handle for one and a half hour, he used to handle for half an hour, we used to have for two hours. Then in 2021, after one year of me starting this program, he finished his bachelor's in 2020 and 2021 March he came to Malaysia. When he came to Malaysia, then we split every first and third Saturday I used to handle in the program Ask Dr. Zakir, every second and fourth Saturday, my son Farik used to handle the program, Ask Sheikh Farik. Now we are the bachelor in Sharia, now he's doing his master's. He finished more than two years of his master's, he's in final year of his master's in Sharia, that is Fiqh and Usul Fiqh, from the Islamic University of Malaysia. He passed from Jamt al Imam, which is one of the best universities in the world, which was, he did, he did about one year Mahad, and then an additional one year, two years, then four and a half years of his bachelor's totally spent about six and a half years in Saudi and he came here. I wanted him to be closer to me so that he learns the practical aspects of Dawa or during the city more of theory. So when he handles, he handles for one hour every fourth, every second and fourth Saturday. I started handling every first and third Saturday of every month and I used to handle for two hours. I say two hours but goes for two hours, ten minutes, two hours, fifteen minutes. Now also, mashallah, the more than two hours that we have started the program. And it's better to take longer session twice a week so I can continue with other activities. Now, there's a world of a difference between my question and answer session in all over the world before I did Hijra. Because it was on comparative religion, the questions were open. Anyone could answer questions. Anyone could ask to me and I have to answer. We used to avoid chits. So 95% of my questions were open question and session. I don't know who to ask, what question, you make a queue. The only policy we had that non-Muslims non were given first preference. So because non-Muslims were given first preference, majority of the questions were on comparative religion or it was answering logical to a non-Muslim. So most of the time, Muslims never had a chance to ask me questions. So Muslims were more in number in the audience, maybe 75%. But during question time, since non-Muslim had preference, Majority times, or maybe more than 50% times, only non-Muslims asked. But as a policy, most of the time, we used to allow at least few Muslims to ask in hand, maybe two questions, three questions. Or sometimes if the audience, there are very few non-Muslims, then Muslims get more chance. So that's the reason, and we used to say that don't ask questions on fiqh, and even now we don't encourage questions on fiqh. But here, when we started this program, Ask Dr. Zakir. As you know, every week, only on WhatsApp, you will receive more than 5,000 questions. 5 to 6 to 7,000. Then we receive several thousand on the Facebook. What we receive in the week, we don't count. Only live, we receive several thousand on the Facebook, several thousand on the, on the YouTube, 
on the Instagram, all put together, we receive about 20,000 questions every week. Since on the Facebook, what live happens, there's a team who's reading and they forward on my mobile, I select an answer. But the WhatsApp is a more formal way of asking questions on this program. And every day they keep on asking, they keep on receiving. There's a team who reads. Normally, I don't think so. We read all the five or 7,000 questions we receive. My team may be reading half of them, sometimes 2,000, sometimes 3,000. From that 3,000, they select about 100 and they send it to me about one day before. I read those 100 and I select 10 or 15 which I should ask. And I've told them, what questions I've already asked. Maybe, I started handling open question and session maybe from 1995 up to 2016. So maybe in more than 20 years of my life, I might have answered a few thousand, I might have given lectures of more than 2,000 or 2,500 lectures, public lectures, in which every, every, every question and session has about 10, 15, 20 questions, because the question and session normally is longer than the talk. So if given two and a half thousand public lectures in 20 years, the question that may be asked may be 25, 30,000 questions. If you remove the duplicates, I don't know how many. Of course, there are many duplicates. So if I have answered about 25 to 30,000 questions in public, not one to one. So if you remove the duplicates, there may be 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, I don't know. Maybe 5,000. So majority of these questions, as I told you, 50% was purely on comparative religion. 30% was on logic only by the non-Muslim or Muslim and 10% was on issues on fiqh which was common and 1% of this 10% that means 0.1% of all the questions may be on comparative fiqh if you can't I cannot think of maybe 3 I told you maybe 4 or 5 not more than that. When I came here, here now I don't want to give the same answers why pork is haram, why alcohol is haram I have given that many number of times if a, question, if a person asks the so same question asked to me in a different program. I cannot say I don't want to answer. But if we ask the same question, the same program, I can say I have already answered. So here I told my team, don't you know my, the question that I have answered. Maybe 25,000, maybe 5,000 on compiled religion. Please don't send those questions back to me. They are already available on the internet, available on the YouTube, on the Facebook, on Alidaya. Please. So they know if it is a question on comparative religion which I have already answered, they don't forward it to me. Only ask me those questions which have not been asked earlier. So, and which are worth answering. So, they select and with their logic or whatever it is, they, they've fought to me 100 best. And from that 100 best, many a times, initially it was very good, you know, all were new. But as now already two, three years have passed, I mean, I've answered more than a thousand questions. The first two years, it was very good. Up to 2020, from 2020 to 2021, 2022. For these two years, it was initially twice a week, then became once a week for one year, then became alternate week but for two hours. So surely in these two years I might have answered more than a thousand questions. Each time I answer about 15 on average, sometimes 10, sometimes 20, sometimes 25, sometimes 30 but average maybe 15 questions. So if you calculate all these, I have surely answered more than a thousand questions the first two years. In 2022, when the pandemic was removed and we could travel, now 50% of the time I'm in Malaysia. When I'm in Malaysia, I handle the question and session. So previously, maybe in the year 21, I might have had more than 52 sessions in a year. In the year 20, 20 Ramzan to 21 Ramzan, more than 50 sessions in a year, every week I have. Then in 21 to 22, maybe, I had about 25 to 30 sessions because alternative week has to come. Then, in 22 to 23, since half the time I was away, maybe in a year I'm handling now 12, maybe 13 or 15, you know, 12 to 13 sessions in a year. It's become less of two hours. Of course, all put together, there will be more than 1,000 questions that answered. Now, after I shifted here, I would say, the questions on comparative religion are approximately 15% only. Like today I spoke on non-veg comparative religion. I quoted. Only 15% on average. I'm not repeating. Maybe if too many people ask, I club it together. 
and a few sessions before I answered on why Islam allows a man to have more than one wife. It's the answer I've given earlier. But because there was a new thing, can you quote for me from the Bible where it says that Solomon had 700 had multiple wives and Prophet Solomon multiple wives, Prophet Abraham. And then this was something new to it. So I had to give the full answer again. So 15% is on comparative religion. Now after, so from 50%, it has gone to 15%. Overall yet today, 60% of my questions are targeted to non-Muslims only. But previously compared to 50%, now it has become 15%. The balance 45% asked by non-Muslims, they are mainly on logic, asked by atheists. Now we find many atheists on the internet trying to misguide the Muslims, trying to create shubha from the Muslims. What I do, that those questions which have become popular, asked by the non-Muslims, against the Quran, against Islam, with reason and logic, trying to prove Islam is not a correct religion, not a correct deen, I am picking up those questions and answering. Other people say, oh, this is shaitani sawal. So my speciality is non-Muslims. So these questions on comparative religion, again, as well, today in the world, I mean, in the English audience or the Urdu, there are hardly a handful of the people who are quoting comparative religion. Now coming to the question asked by non-Muslim, which is on logic only. For example, a non-Muslim will ask the question that you say that Allah is ilmi I said, yes. So when Allah has knowledge Ilme Gheb has all the knowledge. When you do dua, why should you do dua? Allah knows already what is there in your mind. So Allah should answer a prayer directly. That's a logical question. Most of the shaykh will say, oh, shaitani question, don't ask. Satan's question, don't reply, not worth replying. No, it's a logical question. That if Allah is Ilme Gheb, he has knowledge. He knows what's in your mind. So why are you doing dua? Allah should directly answer your prayer. Why you have to do the one, then I'll answer the prayer. And I have given this answer earlier, maybe a year back. So these are questions dealing with logic. It has nothing to do with fiqh, nothing to do with sharia, nothing to do with the Quran. It is pure logic. So these questions which are talking about Islam and it is talking about purely logic. So 45% of my answers now are these questions. As by non-Muslim attacking Quran, attacking Hadith, which is not, that has got to do with logic. Like how today, the person said that if you are a non-vegetarian, if because the lion doesn't have teeth, you and the lion doesn't wear shorts or trousers, even you remove your trousers. It has nothing to do with fix. It's a logical question. How do you reply? Okay, if you say that a non-vegetarian should not wear clothes because lion doesn't wear clothes. If this is your logic. Then you are a vegetarian. The cow doesn't wear clothes. The goat doesn't wear clothes. You remove your, your trouser. No, this is nothing to do with Sharia. Nothing to do with, with Quran. It is pure mantik, pure logic. So this is my speciality. Answering to non-Muslims. And when I'm replying, the Muslims who are watching my answers on compared religion, they are getting impressed with Islam. The non-Muslim, while I'm answering the non-Muslim, even the Muslim, mashallah, what a reply. We're turning the tables over. So yet my speciality is non-Muslim. But it has become less of comparative, has gone more logic. Because today you go on the internet, they're attacking Quran, they're taking most of the Quran. And what is this? What is that? Don't you see Quran says this, Quran says that? It has nothing to do with fiqh. It is mainly how do you reply? So 45% is that. So 60% even today non-Muslim, but comparative has become less. And in the balance, balance 40%, I would say 15% are questions which I answer to non-Muslims, which is not dealing, sorry, which I answer to Muslims, which is not dealing with fiqh, but dealing with logic. For example, a Muslim may ask that, if everything is mentioned in the taqdeer, Allah knows everything in taqdeer, and if I commit murder, Allah wrote down already in advance that I'm going to commit murder, so why am I to blame? Now this is logic. Asked by a Muslim. Many Muslims feel scared to ask, sometimes asked by non-Muslim also. 
basically it's a Muslim question. We believe in takdeer. If Allah ordered my takdeer, I'm going to rob. And if I rob, who's to blame Allah, not me? If it's mentioned in takbir, I'm going to commit murder. And if I commit murder, Allah wrote it. Why am I to blame? So these types of questions, which are logical questions, nothing to do with fiqh, asked by non-Muslims now constitute a, approximately 15%. So 15 plus 40 plus 15, 75%. So balance 25% of my questions today that I take is dealing with fiqh. Again, they may ask that why does Islam, can I take a loan from the bank, can I take scholarship in which I have to return back in installments with interest, is it allowed? So from the 25% that is there of fiqh, 15% is unanimously agreed same. As I mean, interest, everyone says haram, alcohol, everyone says haram. So is alcohol in medicine allowed or not? You know, these questions, or if I'm hungry, can I have pork or not, nothing to eat? So these questions on fiqh, where there's no difference of opinion, it's not dealing with comparative fiqh. The answer is the same by all the four Imams or all the five schools of thought, Hanafi, Shafi, Hamli, Malki, Salafi, or what are you going to call? So out of 25% questions on fiqh, out of which maybe 20, 15% or 20% is on general thing. Maybe 5 or 10% is on comparative fiqh, or maybe you could say 10% is on comparative fiqh. So 15% of the fiqh is unanimous agreement or schools of thought, 10% of the question on comparative fiqh. So if you compare earlier, I used to handle maybe 1% on fiqh, sorry 10% on fiqh, and out of which 0.1% was comparative fiqh. Today I am answering maybe 25% on fiqh, and maybe 10% is on comparative fiqh. From this 10%, comparative fiqh me differs. And when I give answers, believe me, I am not giving any fatwas. I see the view, what has been mentioned by Imam, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ibn the Humble. I respect all these four Ahimahs, I respect them all and they were great scholars. They came to guide the Muslims. And I believe that if anyone follows any of these four Imams, whatever the view is, even if it may not be the authentic view, it will be accepted. I don't believe that all the aimas are barhaq, that all are infallible. No, they are fallible. But if a fatwa, because it's clear cut in Islam, that if a scholar gives a fatwa after doing research with sincerity, if it's the right fatwa, he gets two sawab. If it's if he makes a mistake, yet he gets one sawab. So all these four scholars were great aimas. If anyone follows, any of the view of any one of them, yet it's accepted in Islam. I'm not of the view that if it's not authentic, if because these four scholars are great scholars, we love them, we respect them. If you follow any one of these four scholars, you are following Islam. There may be a view which is afzal, which is more correct opinion, or a view which may not be correct. So if someone gives an opinion and comes, so what you have to read, what type of a person are you? So what I would believe, and I said this earlier, previously there were two types of Muslim. A knowledgeable and ignorant. A mushtaid and non mushtaid Two types. At the time of the Sahaba and later on, oh, either you know or you don't know. Are you a mushtaid or not mushtaid? Mushtaid has the right to do istiyad and give khalaf. As time went on, technology increased, so maybe about 50 years back, you know, 100 years later, 200 years later, 300 years later, I would say there were four types of Muslims. One is a Muslim, who was a namesake Muslim, namesake Muslim but not practicing Muslim. So if he does taqlid, taqlid means following one madhab, whether it be Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, Malki, he is not even practicing, so no problem. Second is a person who is a practicing Muslim and he has knowledge about his mazhab but doesn't have knowledge of comparative fiqh, doesn't do much research. Second category. Third category is a student of knowledge. A person who goes to university, 
who goes to a college, Islamic college, does bachelor's in Sharia or Hadith or Tafsir, he's a student of knowledge and the highest category are the scholars. So previously, maybe 50 years back, there were four types of Muslims, uh, namesake Muslim or a Muslim who is or, or, and, and not practicing. Second category, a practicing Muslim has knowledge about his mother, may not be aware of comparative fiqh, doesn't do much research. So these first two categories, if they follow any particular school of thought, any particular madhab and stick to it, that's what they should do. Because they don't have knowledge of comparative fiqh. The third category is a student of knowledge who's gone to a uh, university, gone to a college, bachelor of maybe Sharia, bachelor of Tafsir, bachelor of Hadith. He is a student of knowledge. So he has a right. Okay, fine, I will check what Abu Hanifa said, what Imam Shafi said. And he may agree, he may disagree. He is a student of knowledge. He has the right to agree or disagree. And the fourth category are scholars. They have the right to give fatwas. They can also choose or they follow what they feel is right. So the first two categories do taklid. Taklid means agreeing or just blindly following. But there are two types of taklid. One taklid is that you follow the scholars because you don't have knowledge, you are blindly following. And second is even if proof is shown to you that the scholar you are following is going against Quran and Sunnah and yet to follow him, that is the real taklid. Otherwise following a scholar is good. But even after showing proof from Quran and Sunnah and Shay Hadith, that see what the scholar has said is good, not matching with Quran and Sunnah, and yet to follow blindly, that is what is objectionable, not the other type. So coming back today, the times have changed. So today what I would do, I would classify the Muslim Ummah into six categories. There are yet some Muslims or namesake Muslims. May not be practicing Islam, may be doing many haram, they are namesake Muslims. Second category are good practicing Muslims and they know basics of Islam but are not involved in research, don't go on internet, they are happy with what they are doing and they are following what the teacher has taught them and they continue. The third category of Muslim may be those Muslims who go on the internet and try and find out and they do more research and they are doing research. The fourth category is those who besides doing research, they are doing extensive research and they are da'if and they talk to non-Muslims and they talk to Muslims and they do Islam and they interact and they do more research and they are doing a lot of research. Maybe they may have more knowledge than person who is doing bachelors in Sharia. They may have more knowledge than people who are doing bachelors of Tafsir because they are spending more time. They may not have the degree. So this is the fourth category who have not gone to a formal madrasa but yet have so much knowledge, may have equal or even more but may not have the formal education. Fourth category. Fifth category is student of knowledge who has got a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD. According to me, uh, one who has a PhD doesn't become a scholar, doesn't become a mushtahid or doesn't become Oh, he is a knowledgeable person. So I would call him a student of knowledge. So those of the Dai's who come on Peace TV, most of them are students of knowledge. Maybe one or two maybe can come under the scholarly category. But most of them are students of knowledge. They may have bachelor's degree, they may have master's, they may not have master's, but they have done a lot of research. They may have PhD. And the last category are scholars. Today, the scholarly category are very few. According to me, handful, maybe a couple of hundred. If you ask me to name, I can name very few. So scholarly have become very less, unfortunately. So I would say that the first three categories whose namesake Muslim, or a person who is good practicing Muslim but knows basis of Islam but not more, a third category goes on internet and does the research but is not a dai, all these three should stick to a madhab. Whether Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, Maliki, or you say Ali Hadith, no, you stick to one. Now one who is going on the internet and doing research, whether Hadith is Sahih or not, okay, what does Hanafi school of thought say, what does Shafi school of thought say, he is yet not qualified to take a decision. So he can find out, okay, fine, I believe in this particular group, I want to follow this, he should follow one particular, he cannot keep on changing 
okay, I follow this fatwa and follow this is wrong. One day he follows the school of Hanifi school of thought, one day Shafi, that is not correct. Because he is yet not qualified to make the decision what is right. But he can make a decision, okay, fine, I believe this is much better than that. So I follow this completely because previously, unless you don't go to a madrasa, you don't know what is right, what a school of thought says. So now because internet has become popular, it came in the, in the late 90s. And you have social media now coming, you know, in 2006, 5. So now social media is more prevalent. Facebook is there, YouTube is there. So if you go on this social media, you can find out, okay, what you prefer. What is the usul of fiqh? Whether it is you believe in this school of thought, that school of thought, Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, Maliki, Salafi. Yes, you can choose. But yet you are not qualified to keep on changing from that by going, Okay, what are the fatwas of the Hanafi school of thought? What are the Shafi school of thought? Okay, fine. You choose one and stick to one. You are third category. You do research. But you are not qualified to say, okay, one, I will do this. Once I will follow this school of thought, then second school. No, you are not qualified. If you reach the fourth stage, where you have so much extensive research that is better than what you do in the madrasa or the university, then you can become close to the student of knowledge. So the fourth category which has not gone to a madrasa, but is a dai, who has learned the basics, what is there, required for fiqh or sulu fiqh, etc., with proper guidance, or who has not gone to university but has met many scholars and met. And then the fifth category, student of knowledge, who has a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD, or has got the degree of mufti or alim, whatever it is, they come in the knowledge of student of knowledge. They come in the category of student of knowledge. They have the right, okay, this I believe in this scholar, this I believe in that scholar. So I consider myself to be a student of knowledge. And the last category of scholars are very few, hardly. Previously there were thousands, now you'll have a couple of hundred, that's it. And coming to the second question. That when muftis come and meet me, they tell me, Dr. Zakir, you know, you're doing great work, you're doing comparative religion, you have, you know, thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands have come to Islam, may Allah reward you, blah, blah, blah. But we have one suggestion. I said, what? Please don't give fatwas. I smile. I said, so if I ask them that if people ask me that if drinking alcohol allowed or not, no, no, that you give answer. I said, why? No, this is normal. Okay, someone asked me eating pork is allowed or not. What I say, the Quranic verse, then I'm going, no, no, allowed or not, no problem. What they actually have problem is only with my two answers, whether the triple talaq is counted as one or three, whether the wudu breaks or not, two or three, not more than that. Then there are scholars who are great scholars, who are very good following. I don't want to take their name. They come and they meet me. They say, Dr. Saab, can we meet you alone? Yes, we go into a room. Oh, Dr. Saab, you are doing great work. May Allah reward you, blah, blah, blah. But don't feel bad, etc. You are doing such good work. But why are you giving fatwas? I said, what fatwas I'm giving? No, you should leave fiqh aside. That's not your speciality. Now, how does he know what's my speciality? Does he know my background? He's a great scholar. I love him. I smile. I said, Jazakallah for your advice. What am I going to do? I respect him. So I said, Jazakallah, Sheikh, may Allah reward you and all. I don't say that I'm going to follow your advice. Because what does he know? Unfortunately, he doesn't know that I've spent more time on comparative religion than medicine. He doesn't know I've spent more time on hadith and fiqh. He doesn't know that. I, I was born in a Shafi family. So my father was a Shafi from Kokan. There are about 25, the 20% Shafi in India. 80% Hanafi in al Sunnah Jamaat. So what I learned as a, as a kid, I was a good practicing Muslim martial average, five times Salah, you know, fasting. I would learn that. Mainly Shafi. When I grew up, my father was well connected with most of the religious scholars of different schools of thought, with Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, Hanbali, yes, from the Saudi, and even al Hadith. So I used to interact with a lot of scholars. And among the Hanafi Fuqahas, the best I liked and the most intelligent according to me was Maulana Mujahid al Qasmi. May Allah have mercy on him. He was wonderful. In my starting ages of Dawah, you know, maybe in the ending of the 90s, I started Dawah in the 90s, I used to meet him and he was even the, the president of the Muslim personal law. And he was a great fuqah. 
according to me amongst any Indian that I would rate number one in Sharia. He was called as Qazi Mujahidul Islam Qazi. And he was excellent. And I learned a lot from him. A lot. So people don't know that. And I met many Hanafi scholars in India, Ali Mian Radvi, may Allah have mercy on him, and Maulana Parikh. I sat with them, I discussed with them, and many, many, many. And then, of course, when I started giving international lectures, and I met even earlier this, so I was mainly a Shafi, what my father was a Shafi, but he was broad minded. So I interacted with many Shafi scholars, then with Hanafi scholars, then Ali Adi scholars in India. Then I started going abroad. I went to Saudi Arabia. I met many scholars. Many. From Saudi Arabia, you want to call them humbly, you want to call them Ali Adi. Then I met the Maliki scholars from Mauritania, all top. So Allah has blessed me that because of my Dawah activities, my lectures became so popular that even though many of the Arabs don't know English, their students said, you should watch Dr. Zaki, and my lectures getting translated. So when they saw my answers, they were very happy. So we discuss. So when I meet these top scholars, they ask me questions on comparative religion, I ask them questions on fiqh. So I studied hadith, and one of my first teachers was Sheikh Zara Manazmin, originally Indian, and I had many, sat with him for weeks together, discussed about hadith, he was my first teacher in hadith. All top scholars, they were scholars. Then Fahab Rahim, Arabic language, and many. So I basically have not gone to any Darul Ulum, but by Allah's grace, I have sat with scholars of fiqh and hadith and tafsir and sharia. Sheikh Abdul Abdul Jibreen, I met Big Bin Ba, some people I met Sheikh Bin Ba, and spoke only once or twice for a few hours. Some people I spent hours and days with together, some people months together, all these top people. So mashallah, Allah has blessed me that I met with a variety of people, Hanafi, Shafi, Hanbali, Maliki, Salafis, MashaAllah. Allah has blessed me and today I have got contacts of most of these people who I meet. I can pick up the phone and call them. If there's a barrier of language, I have my son who can translate. If it's Arabic, some of them speak Arabic and English, both, few of them. Wonderful. But these people who come and meet me, whether it be from Pakistan, they don't know my background. So when I ask them, what is the problem? No, no, why are you giving fatwa? I said, Maulana Saab, you have a problem with my answer triple talaq? Yes, yes, on that. I said, will you say the same thing to the head of the Ahli Hadith in Pakistan? Will that top mufti or... I don't want to take his name. Will you go and take, will you go and talk to the Ahli Hadith in Pakistan? Will you say to Maulana Sajid Mir or Sheikh Sajid Mir, that why do you say triple talaq is one? No. Why? And you come and tell me, oh, it's not your field. What do you know what is my field? I'm a specialist of logic. I'm a specialist for, for, for the non-Muslims. I'm a specialist for comparative. Yes, that's my taqassus. But, I've also studied hadith. I'm not a specialist. I'm a student of knowledge. So I have a right to give, to choose which I believe is more on the haq. Never ever have I given any fatwa on my own, never. And from this 25%, as I told you, 15% are general, no one objection. In the 10% in which there is comparative fiqh, I have always given either the view of Hanafi or Shafi, Hanbali, Maliki or Salafi. 90% 90 90 of the fatwas, they are common. In 10% where they differ, okay, I may agree more with the Salafi. Then maybe with the Shafi, then maybe with the Maliki or Hanafi, okay, fine. But I have a right to choose. All my fatwas are belonging to one of these schools of thought. There may be very few in which in my research I may not agree with any of these four schools of thought, neither with the Salafi. There are one or two, very few. But there are some scholars which are yet scholars from this group of they are not my own fatwa, never. So there are maybe five or six questions that I've answered, maybe, maybe on masturbation, you know, or maybe on very few things, which all the four schools of thought, including Salafi say it's haram, and I may say it's makro, I may have the reason, I may quote, then I've quoted the call of Ibn Abbas, I've, I've Ibn Hazm, I've quoted uh, uh, Shawkani, 
I've quoted the present time uh, among the Kubar Ulma, Sheikh Abdullah Mutlaq. So, it is not an individual call. Yes, it is not the view of any school of thought. It is not the Jammur view. It is a minority view. Now, lately, two weeks back, there was a Yemeni who had done PhD. And he, saw, and he came to know about my view on masturbation. He said, Dr. Zakir, you have said masturbation is makru. No, it should be muba. I say it is fard. I, I know that when I gave this answer, there were many people from Hawani school of thought, from Shafi school of thought, from, from Salafi, who said Dr. Zakir is wrong, and I respect them. Because this is not the answer of any one of the schools of thought, neither Salafi school of thought. And even Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Nasruddin al-Bani, Sheikh bin Ba'ath, Sheikh Taymiyyah, all of them said it is haram. But I give my opinion, I say makru, why? It is a question on medical. And I'm a medical doctor and the full answer is for 25 minutes. Then I give a rebuttal for 55 minutes. Both put together 120 minutes which I don't want to repeat. But I'm going to tell you that it had all references in the new fatwa. It is by uh, the, uh, Ibn Hazm, who is mashallah muhaddis, a historian, a faqi, answer given by Shah. You know, he lived maybe more than a thousand years. Then I gave this reply also given, I, I, I named the, the Sabas, I, I give the name of Tabain, then I gave Ibn Hazm, then I gave the name of Shawkani, was hardly 150 years back. Then I gave the present time who's living, Abdullah Mutlaq. He is from the Qubar Ulma. That means I'm not giving my own fatwa. It's a minority of the view. Maybe very small minority. But these scholars are known scholars. And people say, oh, Dr. Zakir Naik, he should stick to medicine. Now one Salafi is telling <laughs> that Zakir Naik, will he ever say this? Oh, Zakir Naik, no. He doesn't know this, he doesn't know Arabic, he doesn't know that I have uh, a lot of group in Bombay. At any given time, we had at least 30 to 40 alims from the Indian University, whether from Deoband, whether from Nadwa, 30 to 40 were muftis and alims and fazil. At any given time in organization, when we had more than 500 employees, we had at least 20 to 30, 20 to 25 from the foreign university. Maybe bachelor or masters or PhD in Madinah University or Jamt al Imam or <laughs> maybe Al Azhar. So these people are talking, don't know my background. That means at any given time, I had, mashallah, 40 to 50 students of knowledge, bachelor's, master's, and PhDs. 20 to 25 from Madinah. I don't know of any DAO organization in the world which had such a battery of bachelor's, master's, PhDs from, from Madinah University, from Jamat al Imam, from Al Azhar, from Yemen University, from the Indian universities. So these people don't know, they only see me on the skin and they're talking, talking, talking. Okay, if you want to learn from me, I will help you. What? I will help him. <laughs> we neglect these people are youngsters. They are young guys. They speak. They don't know my background. So before offering, they should know it is my background. That I've checked the answers. And today, these people who talk, do they have access to the drop scholars? No. They read the books, but they cannot pick up a phone and ask them. Now, mashallah, today Allah is blessed that I've got the contacts of the top scholars. I can pick up a phone and ask them. Some of the scholars are behind bars. But they sat with them, hours together, days together, months together. I'm not then giving anything out of the blue. I never give fatwas on moon. Yes, I give the view of one of the schools of thought, or whether Hanafi, Shafi, Hamli, Malki, or Salafi. And very few occasions it may not be the view of any of these. But yet, there are top scholars who have given this view. So what I want these people, when they come to meet me, I love them. I respect them. I have no problem. They may not agree with my view. But they come and tell me, oh, Dr. Zakir, it is not your specialty. You are on comparative religion. That same person who is talking to me, he writes a book on Islam and Christianity. Now, when I read that book, there are mistakes. Am I going to tell him not to write on Islam and comparative religion? No, let him write. If he makes one or two mistakes, does it mean I will tell him, he's a scholar. Okay, if he writes on Islam and comparative religion, if he's done his study, and in the book he writes 100 points, out of which maybe five are wrong. Will I tell him not to write? I may go and tell him, okay, these are shake, it is by mistake, or no printer, devil, and correct. When I spoke to Dida, I asked to talk to him also. I asked to tell Sheikh Dida, can I put a point across? And he used to love it. Oh, Dr. Dad, oh, my son, you're excellent. Now these people come and tell me, your special is compared to religion, 
What do they know about my speciality? Yes, my speciality is comparative religion. If I tell them that the book you have written is wrong, why are you speaking on comparative religion? They feel hurt. So what they fail to realize that the person who is in the field, other than telling me oh, what they should in this answer is right or wrong. So when people objected to my answer on masturbation, I gave a counter reply of 55 minutes answering all the arguments. Again, with Quran and Hadith. I'm, and I respect many of my close friends who come on Peace TV, most of them disagreed, no problem. But they disagreed, they disagreed with respect. Okay, this is the opinion of Bin Baz, we agree with that, no problem. Opinion of Asul Dalman, no problem. I disagreed with the opinion of, of, of Sheikh Utaymin, of Bin Baz, of Asul Dalbani, of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyum. I respect all of them, these are my main. But on one issue, I being a medical doctor, I having some information, I'm quoting. So what I have to realize that rather than discussing on the issue, coming and meeting me personally and then going and telling out in public, we told Dr. Zaki, now Dr. Zaki, now will not speak. There was one person who came from Pakistan and we discussed on talaq. And I told them, yes, I'm aware that in Saudi Arabia, there are 400, there are more than 400 fatwas which say triple talaq is counted as three. Counted as three. I was shocked. That doesn't mean I agree with that. So, what my mind has broadened that I may agree with a view which is more authentic, but if it's said by a great scholar and a Muslim follows, Inshallah, Allah will accept it. This is the broad-mindedness. And people, when they talk about tilaf, they normally give a very famous incidence of when the Prophet told the people going to Bani Qurayda. And they say that you see to it that you reach Bani Qurayda by Asr and pray Asr there. And we know, we know that famous incidence, I'll just say it in short. And we know that some of the Sabas, when they could not reach in time, they were late, they prayed before reaching Bani Qurayda. The other said, no, the Prophet said, you reach Bani Qurayda by Asar and pray Asar there. So some of them prayed before because they were late. They said, no, what the Prophet meant was really, we have to reach before there. But that doesn't mean that if we reach late, we should do Qaza of the Asar Salah because doing Qaza is haram. So one group said, they prayed. The other group said, no, no, we'll follow what the Prophet said. We'll pray there only. So when both the groups of Sahabas, they went to the Prophet and they told that one of them said, we wanted to reach, but we were delayed. But the time for Asar came, we didn't want to Qaza. And we agreed that you wanted us to reach early, but that doesn't mean that if we reach late, we should not offer Asar, so we prayed Asar. The other group said, no, we followed the instruction, reach in Bani Qurayda and pray Asar. So even though the time for Asar came, we didn't pray, we followed you. So the Prophet said, both are right. Because what was the Niyyah? Both of the Niyyah was to follow the Prophet. Now one group misunderstood or rather they thought that the Prophet said pray in Bani Qurayda Asar irrespective whether you are late or early. Others thought no, what the Prophet wanted to tell us that reach before Asar time and pray Asar there. But that doesn't mean that if you reach late you don't pray Asar and pray Qaza in Bani Qurayda. That's not allowed in Islam. So when the Prophet said okay you understood that what I meant was pray in Bani Qurayda Asar and you did not pray before even the time, you are right. What do you thought? No, reach early. But if you reach late, you pray wherever you are. Both are right. Now, this is usul. So most of the people give this example and they say, the way you understand is right. But it doesn't stop there. What I'm asking, what did the Prophet actually mean? Today, what will I do? So if you misunderstand the Prophet, and you follow thinking what the Prophet said and you follow that inshallah you are right Allah will give you reward but my question is what did the Prophet actually mean so there are scholars who quoted other hadith and realized and when they asked the Prophet what they really meant was of course the Prophet had clearly said that doing kaza is haram so what the Prophet actually meant was he wanted the sahabas to reach Bani Qurayda before Asar but that does, and pray asar there. That doesn't mean that if you are late, you don't pray. Because not praying is haram in Islam. Unless, if there are certain situations where someone is drowning and I'm going to save him, or the house is caught on fire and the Maghrib time is getting over, in this it is accepted. But this was not such a situation. 
So the scholars, what they say, what the Prophet actually meant was, he wanted the Sahabas to reach early in Bani Qurayda, but that does not mean that if they reach late, they should not offer Asr. This is the true verdict. So what the Prophet actually wanted was, he wanted them to reach early. But if they reach late, that does not mean they don't pray. So the, the, the Sahabas who prayed before reaching Bani Qurayda, Asar on time, are correct. But because the other group misunderstood, because they misunderstood and they followed that, even they, Allah will agree with them. But their understanding of the prophets was wrong. So, in comparative fic, we have to go in detail. Just give this example and stop is not correct. So, if you misunderstand, thinking the prophet said this, and you follow, that's the reason if our understanding is broad. And if one school of thought gives a fatwa, and you realize that, that, my understanding of hadith is no, it is wrong. And they say it is right. Then yes, correct, Allah will accept it. If it's wrong, they get one sawab. If it's right, they get two sawab. So meeting great scholars of different, as long as the niyah is correct. So our vision becomes broader. So traveling after coming to Malaysia, mashallah, my whole has changed. Now we are meeting more number of shaykhs more number of ulamas from all over the world. We are meeting many Muslim politicians, many heads of states. We are discussing. So the life has changed. The impact has changed, mashallah. Allah has blessed that the Facebook has increased. Previously it was maybe 14 million, now it's 23.5 million. Previously the Facebook was 400,000 when I was in India. Now it's 3.6 million. The Instagram has reached more than them. So, alhamdulillah, this is Allah's blessing. We did hijrah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, these people who come to meet me, I love them. I respect them. I honor them when they come. But that doesn't mean everything what they say, I'm going to agree. So, they come as a jazakallah for advice. That doesn't mean I'm going to follow it. So, when they go back, they may have a misunderstanding. Okay, Dr. Zaki Naik. No, no. Alhamdulillah, in these last few years, our knowledge has increased. And the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And I said this earlier, the more you know, the more you realize we don't know. We know that we don't even have a drop, a knowledge of drop in the ocean. Our knowledge of Islam is less than drop in the ocean. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So with this, we are just trying to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, serve Islam. I love the scholars of Ayla Sunnah wal Jama whether they come from this school of thought or that school of thought, whether they come from this organization, whether it's Jamaat Islami, whether it be with public Jamaat, we may agree with many things, we may disagree with something. That doesn't mean I love and I pray for all the issue. So that has been my policy. So when someone comes and meets me, and if he says something, he may be right, he may be wrong. So this is my policy that Alhamdulillah after doing Hijrah, we are meeting more of the scholars, more of the student of knowledge, more of the knights from different parts of the world. Our interaction has increased, our vision has broadened, we have become more broad-minded, we have become more tolerant, we have become, you know, the unity of the Ummah is important. That's the reason my talk on unity of Muslim Ummah is much better now than what it was earlier. With this, I think we have spoken a lot. We have, instead of two hours, we have gone for two hours, 45 minutes. So this was the last question and the answer was long because it was on comparative fic and I had to answer the details. So please excuse me for that. With this question we end this session. Until we meet next time, the next Saturday inshallah would be my son answering the session. Ask Sheikh Farik. That is on the uh, ninth of September, 16th of September, two weeks from now, inshallah, I'll be handling Ask Dr. Zakir. And after that, since I'll be traveling, I have lecture tours, I'll be traveling for about two to three months. So for two to three months, this session, uh, these programs will discontinue. So next Saturday will be my son Farik. Now he's in Indonesia, he's going to come after two days, two days inshallah. He was on a lecture tour to Indonesia and then a short vacation with his wife. He will come after two days, he will handle on Friday, inshallah, he will handle the next Saturday. And after two weeks after that, I will be handling. Till then, we meet on 16th of September. Wa akhir dawan, alhamdulillah, alameen.
السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ